So. Okay. All right. So my mentor, Caleb Roth, he did, he did a study where he listed two batches of books. I think there was about a hundred books in each batch and he shipped them to Amazon and one of them he assigned a reprice or two and the other one he didn't assign a reprice or two at all. So basically one batch of books was using reprice it and the other batch of books was using the price that he set initially. And Rustin, if you can make sure people are muted so there's not all this background noise. And what he found was the difference oh, wasn't, there wasn't a huge difference in the sell-through rate. Sorry about that, Rustin just muted me. 40% of the books didn't even get repriced uh, that he sent on, on the repricing batch. So only 60% of the books got repriced that he sent in. So this, this experiment really showed that the first price you set for books may be the last price you set. So when you set a price for your books, make sure it's the price that you would actually like to sell it for because it may never change again. Even if you're using channel max, even if you're using reprice it, there's a chance that the price just won't change. And we'll go more into detail. And this is actually my fourth point where I talk more in depth about repricing but there's a high chance that your, your books won't be repriced again. So that experiment, he actually ended up making more profit with the batch that was being repriced than the batch that wasn't. But we found out that 40% of the books weren't even repriced in the first place. So it's, it's pretty important to, to set your prices intentionally when you first list your books, intentionally and intelligently. So I'm going to show you guys how you can sell your books for 25% more profit than your competitors. If that sounds good, comment one below. Let's light up this comment section. I'm gonna give some shout outs. Comment one, if that sounds good. What's up, Andres? What's up, Matthew? Matthew will be speaking later. Elizabeth, David Campbell, we got JK. Deb, Andre, Jamie, Daryl, Bill. All right, let's get into it, guys. Okay. So here's one of the big secrets that maybe you guys do know this, maybe you don't, but price against FBA offers. Here's why it's genius. Amazon tries to keep prices low to keep customers happy, and sellers suffer as a result. So this strategy allows us to maximize profits by pricing strategically. We're able to price books competitively against FBA prices. Who here has a Prime membership? Comment Prime if you've used Amazon Prime to get two-day shipping. Maybe you were doing uh, shopping for your mother over the weekend. I know I bought her a present Saturday, and it actually arrived Monday, so that was my fault. But uh, Prime shipping is huge, and people pay a premium for Prime. If there's, you know, if there's an option to buy a book for ten dollars, merchant fulfilled, and it takes seven days to get to you or there's an option to pay $15 and it takes two days to get to you. A lot of people opt for the prime. Ray's got a prime membership. Daryl's got a prime. Judith, David, Don, JK, Matthew, Deb. Guys, a lot of people have prime memberships. So the old way and the way a lot of people do it is manually reprice your books every day and waste hours of time and then let your books turn from profitable to trash because they sit in inventory way too long without selling. And guys, like this is way worse today than ever before. If you have books that aren't worth selling at Amazon, you have to pay $2 to remove each book. So if you have 100 books, you're going to pay 200 bucks just to remove those books. It's, it's a ripoff. So make sure the stuff you're sending to Amazon's good. And uh, the old ways people rely on blind software is to end up selling your inventory far too cheap. So I'll talk more about repricing in a bit, but it's important to not let your software just, you know, tank your prices to the ground. And you can do that by setting minimum prices and different things like that. So really what we're focusing on when we're initially pricing our books is to maximize the prime bump uh, by pricing your, your items higher if there's prime competition. So if you see this prime check here, on books, these books can sell for more than the regular books. So for anyone here that doesn't know what Amazon FBA is, 
basically the way Amazon FBA works is you take your books, you ship them to Amazon, Amazon stores them, preps them, and gets them ready for sale for the customer. And they handle customer service and everything versus FBM, which is where you would do this all from your house. There's huge FBM sellers out there. They have warehouses. They you know, have hundreds of thousands of books listed in their warehouse. But the thing is, they cannot compete with us because we offer two-day shipping and they don't. Because they have their own warehouse and they're shipping the book directly to the customer, Amazon doesn't trust them to deliver it in two days. But if you ship your items to Amazon, Amazon does trust them deliver the items in a couple of days. So you're good to go there. So you can make a lot more money uh, by pricing prime. You're doing more by doing less because all your items are Amazon. Amazon's handling the prep, all that stuff. You can keep your books priced at higher prices. You're making more profit and you don't have to prep the book and ship it to the customer. You don't have to deal with customer service, all of that. This is especially prevalent with higher price books. Again, Caleb brought did a study and he found out like the number one variable that determines how much more you can price a book for is the price. So if the price of the book is high, there's a pretty good chance you can price the book for, uh, for higher if it's prime. So if you have a hundred dollar book, there's a much higher chance you can price it for 120 and get the sale versus a $10 book and pricing it for 15 plus much higher chance that you're able to get more margin on your prime books if your average sales price is higher. So the low price, when I sold my book, this, uh, this biology textbook, the low price at the time was $128. Now, when I sold it, I sold it for $193. This is a $64 difference. The only difference was I was selling mine Amazon FBA, Amazon Prime, and this competitor, 18 books, they had their warehouse, all their fancy stuff, but I was able to make $60 more than them just because I had prime shipping. So guys, don't sleep on this. Don't match the low price. Price your books intelligently up front. Also, here's a crazy example. I, I bought this Jewish set of books at a uh, library sale and I was able to sell it. It was $1,300 $1, was the lowest price and I was able to sell it for $2,000 total. So I made an extra $700 just because of the prime bump. So shameless plug, GoTo Lister has smart pricing. I'll show you guys the triggers. So when you guys go out and you're finding books, how many times comment below if you found a book from Scout IQ, Scoutly, whatever scouting app you're using, and you go to list it on your listing software and it says that it's you know going for less. Comment below if that's ever happened to you. Now, I'm not saying GoToLister is going to fix this 100%, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize your profits by pricing your faster selling books higher. And if you look at this, you can see we have, what we've done is these aren't triggers, but these are effectively rules that when you list your books with GoToLister, we price your books higher if they sell faster. So if you have like a top 10% selling book, anywhere from one to 125,000 sales rank, we're going to price your book at FBA offer four, which is if you look at an Amazon listing and there's four FBA offers, we're pricing at the fourth highest. That's most likely going to be several dollars above the buy box. So you're able to make a lot more profit just by pricing the books that you're listing that are fast moving higher. Now, including go to lister scout iq all these apps out there repriced at channel max they're not able to see all the prime offers so one thing that we've programmed go to lister to do is it actually shows you whenever there's not prime offers so let me see if i can pull up an example here it comes up purple so what we've done is if you list a book <clears throat> without prime offers it'll it'll highlight this purple and it'll encourage you to actually open up the book and price it yourself. So we can open this up. You can see there's, there's one prime offer here for 3,800. So if, if I was sending this prime, I would just match this price. But if there's no prime offers, that's an opportunity to price your book higher and, and Go to lister will actually turn the book purple for you. That way, you know, hey, this is a book that you could probably price for an extra 15 bucks. 
So smart pricing done automatically for you, but still, even with GoToLister, I still recommend that you guys look at the look at the batch before you finish it. Because like I said, the first price you set for your books could be the last price you set. You can see how using this technique can increase your profits 25%, if not more, can't you? Wouldn't it be nice if you got larger consistent payouts from Amazon versus just selling your books for pennies on the dollar? Don't let repricers screw up your, your stuff. And even when I give you guys repricing advice, like keep in mind, you know, monitor your prices and it's very important to set the first price of your book high. And you know, what you could do is when you set that price higher, keep that price high by setting that as your minimum price and saying, I'm not going to settle anything less than the price I set it for, for at least 30 days. That's what I recommend you guys do. Comment one, if you commit to selling your books for maximum profits by looking for price gaps in the prime offer and the low offer. Comment one below. Elizabeth says, yep. Manuel says one. Says one. Deb says one. David, Paul, Amy says, I'm not going to settle for less profit. Matthew says one. All right. Let's get into this. We got some more people rolling up in here. Okay, the next one is save time. So if you're just wasting time in your business, you know, running around like you're like a chicken with his head cut off, you're not doing the important things. Your stress is going to go through the roof. You're not going to make as much money. You're just not going to be a good business person overall. So save time. Anytime, anytime you can automate something, automate it. Anytime you can delegate something, delegate it. Anytime you can decrease the time it takes to do something, do that. So I'm going to go over a couple of different strategies you guys can use. And this first strategy is really for beginners. If you're just starting out selling books, it's important that you, you source books quickly. So your ability to find, source, and list profitable books on Amazon is what ultimately determines your success. So the faster you can find profitable books to sell on Amazon, the quicker you have success. So make sure you're not finding books slow. Make sure you're finding books fast. So the old way of doing this was analyzing the price of the book and sales rank yourself, studying books that sold on eBay and memorizing them. People would literally say, oh, you know, I, I developed an eye for books. They would go into bookstores and they'd say, I know Jewish books sell good. I know bullfighting books sell good. I know X type of fiction books sell good. This is great, but you got to rely on data. You can't just always go off instinct. And plus, it takes a long, long time to develop that type of skill. People also used to use the Amazon Seller app. And hopefully you guys aren't doing this. But unless you're in a, an area with extremely profitable books, you're going to have trouble running a, a profitable book business if it takes you this long to determine if a book's profitable. You have to open up this Amazon Seller app. You'd have to go and click around, look at the fees, scan the book. And it just takes a long time. And uh you know, when you're looking at all these numbers and stuff, you can get confused like these people you see on the screen here. They're confused because they're looking at sales rank. They don't know if the Amazon fees are accurate. They, they're, they're just not really sure what to do. So what typically happens is the, the books they purchase are not profitable or they purchase books that look profitable, but they don't end up selling. And it just takes them way too long to make a decision, so they quit. So here's what to do instead. And I apologize for the text being so small, but utilize a simple app, whether it's Scout IQ or some other app. Utilize the app and make sure that you use the downloadable database. You can download all the books that are commonly scanned by booksellers on your phone. And even if you don't have Wi-Fi, even if you're in a dungeon or on the moon or somewhere else, you can still use your phone to look up these books and it makes an instant decision. It's literally instantaneous. It's not one second. It's not a 10th of a second. It's instantaneous. It, it pulls it up and instantly tells you yes or no, you should buy the book. So these are called triggers. It, it tells you whether or not the book is a buy or not. So here's a book that that's a buy according to Scoutly. And here's a book that's a buy according to Scout IQ. You can use the app on your phone to scan the book. And you guys really want to make sure that you're using the database and that you're scanning books as quickly as possible because the name of the game is to get through the bad books first. If you can get through the bad books, then 
you'll find the good books. But if it takes you a minute or two to analyze each book and 95% of the books are not profitable, you're not going to leave the store with that many books. So this app takes the guesswork out of the process. All you have to do is scan the barcode. I'm probably preaching the choir here. I know a lot of you guys are more advanced, but um, this is just a reminder, you know, scan your books fast and, you know, use a Bluetooth scanner. If you have a Bluetooth scanner connected to your phone, you can scan even faster. Make sure, you know, if you scan twice as many books per hour, you're literally going to make twice as much money. So the other thing is don't waste time listing books slow because if you're spending most of your time listing books, you're not spending your time finding books. And the name of any Amazon business is finding profitable inventory. Even me, I'm doing wholesale right now. I've done over 10,000 profit over the last 30 days. I'll show you some of that uh, in a little bit. But even with that, you know, if I'm spending too much time repricing, if I'm spending too much time doing anything other than finding more profitable product, my business isn't going to grow. That's why it's important not to focus all your time on doing things like listing books. So the old way is using Seller Central to list your books or store the books in your house. People, you know, you can do Merchant Fulfilled. There's pros and cons to it, but it, it does consume a lot more of your time. And if you're not organized like me, your house is going to look like this. So you're going to have books all over the place. I, I, I lose books. My team, lose, we do Merchant Fulfilled and we lose stuff. The alternative is keep a clean space like this and use Amazon FBA. So ship all your books to Amazon, have them store the books, have them prep the books, have them do all that. So use Amazon space, not your living room and list your books at lightning speed. If you guys wanna use go to a lister, that's gonna allow you to list the books way faster. So let me just demonstrate real quick how fast you can list a book. And I got a couple of books with me here. I do not have a scanner though. So I'm going to show you guys, if you're in go to lister, you create a batch. The thing I didn't like about other listing softwares is look at this. So if you're listing a book, you see how it takes one, two, three, four, five, six. It's taking a long, just Mexican Wi-Fi for you guys. And that, and sometimes Amazon just takes a long time. Sometimes you can have fast Wi-Fi, but Amazon just takes forever. So instead what you can do is I'm going to scan the book in one time. I'm going to scan the book in two times, three times. I can use my scanner to keep scanning the book. It cues them up. That way you can keep your workflow going. You can keep working, scanning books, and you can literally list books in like a fraction of the time. If it used to take you one hour, you should be able to do it in 30 to 45 minutes, if not less, because you don't have to wait on the slow response times. That's one way we've innovated uh, the listing software space. So you can see how this can make you both these techniques using an app with a database and using an optimized uh, listing workflow and not keeping your place cluttered, keeping your, your space nice and clean can save you a ton of time and make you way more money, right? So how would saving time affect your life? Comment below because, you know, we talk about saving time and sometimes people don't really realize like there's only so many hours in a day. And if you're trying to build an Amazon business that pumps out profits, time is money. So how would saving time affect your life? Comment below and I'll read some shout outs right now. Less headaches, says Paul. More time for pro profitable activities or just fun stuff. Maybe you want to go hiking on a trail and look at moose up in Canada. JK says, give me time to do fun stuff. That's what I like to do personally. I'm here in Mexico. We got a great dance class. I would rather not be listing books. More time to source. Sometimes listing books is fun, though. You get to see that profit number go up. All right. Better quality time of life. Yep. So are you going to commit to not wasting time listing books? Comment one if so. The most important strategy in your Amazon business, if you guys are booksellers, online arbitrage, wholesale is finding more profitable products. So comment one, if you commit, not wasting time listing books. Tony, JK, Paul, Susanna. All right. The third thing that a lot of people don't do, and this really helps, this helps me in every business once I start doing this, is setting goals 
looking at the important things and measuring your profit. You have to measure your profit. If you, if you want it to grow, you have to know what it is. So Peter Drucker, this guy that I've quoted hundreds of times, says you cannot manage what you do not measure. So make sure on a monthly basis that you understand how much profit you're pumping out. All right, so let me show you guys real quick. If we go over here, there's a few things I wanna show you guys to help you manage your profit. So all my go-to lister users, Here's my dashboard right now. I landed a really profitable wholesale deal. And this profit here, this is factoring in all Amazon fees, 6,800 6, in Amazon fees, and then also $11,000 worth of inventory. I paid $11,000 for inventory. Did a total of 34,000 in sales. So we subtract 11,000 from it. And then the 6,000 in Amazon fees. Now I still have prep fees about $1,000 in prep fees, and I still have inbound shipping fees. So let's just say $300 in inbound, inbound shipping fees. So that still leaves me with $14,500 profit. I know I'm on the right track. I can open this up, and on a daily basis, I can see how much profit my Amazon business is making. And I would like to see more screenshots from the community, guys. I would like to see you guys screenshot flex your sales for GoToLister. So if you guys are using GoToLister, and you can see your profit, um, and it's it's accurate. Make sure that you guys are entering your buy cost. Otherwise, these numbers won't be accurate. There's ways that you can update your buy cost later. You guys can actually go here to this page. I had to, I can't show this page to you guys because you'll see all my products, and you guys will steal my products, and that wouldn't be good. But this is a screenshot of it, incognito mode. You can actually update your cost here. And if you update one product, it'll update all the products that have uh, the same ASIN. So that's, that's one way you can manage your profits. Another way that we do more in depth is we actually use what's called the tracking spreadsheet. Taylor Roth made this, and this allows you, this is what we use for restricted inventory. This is how we manage and payouts. This is really how profit our business is making uh, on, on a more grand news. And every single month, guys, you should be checking how much profit did my book business actually make. And you should set goals too. You should set, you know, I, I want to make at least 5,000 profit each month. So what I want you guys to do right now is comment what profit goal do you have for the next 30 days? And what profit goal would really excite you? Like what profit goal selling books on Amazon or just selling on Amazon in general would get you fired up. And I'll give some shout outs. Type those profit numbers below. Profit per month. I'm not talking sales per month. I'm talking profit per month. iPhone says 20K, 20K profit. That's good. JK says 6,000. James says goal is 5K, but I would love to get to, uh, to 10K to truly be happy. Yeah, shoot for 10K, shoot for more. 5K a month profit would make me smile, says Lee. I'd be happy with 10K, says Ken. Amy says 5K. Susanna says goal is 5K. Yeah, 5K profits all, guys. It's completely doable. You only need to do like 10 to 15,000 in sales as a bookseller because profit margins are 40, 50%. As long as you're keeping, you know, a healthy average sales price. And, you know, it obviously gets different when you have bulk books, you have empo employees to pay all that, but starting out, you know, 10, 15,000 in sales is a one man show, easily 5K profit. Who here commits to measuring their profit on a monthly basis? Comment one below, give some shout outs. All right, so the last part I wanna talk about, Don says one, David says, heck yeah. Matthew says one. Lee says one with go to Lister. Susanna says one. And also, guys, I'll drop if you guys are interested in that spreadsheet, the tracking spreadsheet. I'll drop a link for it below. If you guys look in the comments, this is what I use to manage my business on a more granular, granular level. I don't know why I can't say that word tonight. And uh, yeah, it's a great spreadsheet.
So this last part, I might actually have you guys unmute yourselves and we could, you know, share some ideas on this. But the last part is to reprice intelligently. You want to make sure that, you know, after you set those initial prices, a few months might go by. You want to make sure that you're repricing your books to sell, especially if you're sending your books to Amazon FBA. Because if you're sending your books to Amazon FBA, and remember, you got to pay almost two dollars to dispose of books these days so really the name of the game when repricing is optimizing for not paying these outrageous fees and i think the fees the fees are that high guys they're not that high because it costs that much for amazon to remove them if you pay for ten thousand cds and dvds to be disposed of you'll pay 20 grand i guarantee you it doesn't take amazon twenty thousand dollars to pay their employees it probably cost them less than a thousand bucks it probably cost them less than 300 bucks or 100 bucks. I could do that in a day. I could throw away 10,000 books easily in a day, but they charge outrageous fees for it. They're doing it more to prevent you from sending them crappy items. They don't want you to take up their space. So let me, uh, I have this blog here. I know some of you guys probably saw this earlier this week or last week. I'll drop this below. I keep DMing people by accident. Here we go. So here's the blog. Um, and I'll also share my screen and open up this blog too. This I'm going to go over my whole repricing strategy for you guys. And you guys can use any repricer to emulate this. But this is how to reprice your books and increase your profit margins by 25%. Remember, a part of increasing your profit margin is being willing to sell your books at a loss. If you lose a dollar selling a book, that's better than paying $2 to get rid of it. And so you have to be thinking this way. Okay, so if you guys want to read the in-depth article, go to romer.biz forward slash blog one. But real quick, we'll go over the goals of repricing. You want to sell your books at the highest price possible, obviously. But you don't want to slow down your sell-through rate because if you slow down your sell-through rate, you screw up your cash flow and then you end up paying more fees. You also want to maintain a healthy sell-through rate of at least 20% per month. If you go too far above that, you're probably selling your books too cheap. If you go too far below that, your books are probably priced too high, or you're just sending crappy books to Amazon. And then three, you want to purge any inventory by pricing to the lowest price possible without exceeding paying Amazon, the, the price to pay Amazon to remove the book. So if you sell a textbook for $8, you'd probably lose $7 after Amazon fees. So don't sell textbooks for $8, guys. Just pay Amazon the $2 to dispose of it, okay? This is a really important concept. You, you gotta find out, and if you guys are selling regular books, that's why it's important to track which books are textbooks and which books aren't. With GoToLister, we'll, we'll allow you to do that pretty soon. You could actually do that now if you wanted to. When you put the source, just put TXT in front of it. That way you know that those books are textbooks. It's going to cost a lot more. Even $10 textbooks would probably lose you four or five bucks. So the average weight of a book, I think, is 1.2 pounds. So I would just go off of that. Right now, a break-even price selling books on Amazon is about $7.50, $7.50, eight bucks, somewhere in that range. So it's better to sell a book for $6 if it loses you $1.50 than it is to pay Amazon upwards of $2.20, if not more, uh, to remove or dispose of the book. So this is kind of our goal. We want to make as much money as possible. Healthy sell-through rate. Purge any inventory when the time comes. And the time comes before those long-term storage fees. On that. And let me know if you guys can hear me. One in the chat. If I if if I'm uh if you guys can hear me, go drop a two in the chat if my Mex and Wi-Fi is acting a little sketchy. Uh, um okay. So here's our schedule. Two. <laughs> Some people are saying two. Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Make sure my phone's disconnected. 
So yeah, we got to deal with the Mexican Wi-Fi. So while while listing our books, the first 30 days, I like to use the price that go to lister set, or maybe you're using some other listing software, whatever price you set for that, you want to make sure that it stays at that price for 30 days. So you can allow it to sell for that price. For 30 to 90 days, we're going to drop to a minimum price um, from the initial price set to eight dollars. So from 30 to 90 days, we're willing we're willing to drop to at least eight dollars, but not less, because less than eight dollars is you're losing money. Eight dollars, you're you're at least breaking even. And from 30 to 90 days, we're also matching buy box. For 90 days plus that's when we start undercutting the buy box and we just want to sell the inventory and get rid of it. And again, depending on what type of books you're selling, you can drop your price as low as like $6 and then just get rid of it. That way you don't have to pay the long-term storage fees or you don't have to pay the outrageous removal fees. So again, the first price you set may be the last price you set. Make sure you're maximizing the prime bump we do this with our repricer a few different ways. And one of the ways we maximize the prime bump is every night, I learned this from Scott Needham, he took his profit margins from 14% to 18% simply by pricing up at night. That's several million dollars. He does like 40 million a year. He was able to increase his profit margin several million dollars by pricing up at night. Because when you price your up at night, the next morning when it goes back down, other people may have changed their price. Other people may have sold out, or maybe you're the only person on the listing. So when you go back down to the buy box price, now the whole market value is a little bit higher. So a lot of different scenarios where pricing up at night can, can increase your, your profit margins. It can increase that gap we were talking about earlier, maximizing the number of offers that, maximizing that prime bump. So you want to you want to always be if you're a prime offer you always want to be the highest price you can be while still getting the sale while still getting the buy box. You can also reprice raise your prices in the afternoon if you want to. Be careful with this one. This one could kind of slow down your sales a little bit, but you want to use any opportunity you can to increase your prices because if you increase your prices, if you never increase your prices, the price is never going to go up. If your repricers only programmed to go down in price, then it's only ever going to go down. So um, that that's everything to do with repricing. Do we have any quick questions on that? If you guys want, you can unmute yourself. I see Tony saying, does GoToLister reprice for you throughout the day? No, GoToLister, we only help you set that initial price. We do not reprice for you. Uh, however, just for being a GoToLister user, if you message us, hey, help me set up my repricer, we will help you set up your channel max repricer for you. And we'll do that exact settings that I just went over. We will set up for you. So we'll make sure that you're not only sending books in at a good price, but we'll also make sure that you're using the same repricing strategy that I use to optimize sell through. And also you reprice up at night. So you do get a little bit more of that prime bump. And if you're not te technologically advanced and if it freaks you out to set up a repricer, uh, my team will do that for you. So we have a course, but uh, yeah, somebody says a great robot voice. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, would you say repricing zero to 30, 30, 90, 90 plus strategy good for OA as well? Yeah, I, I, Lilo, I would say like, yeah, we basically use the same repricing strategy, zero to 30. Um, we're actually like a little bit more aggressive. Like if our OA stuff isn't moving, we're not going to wait 90 days to reprice aggressively. We're going to reprice a little bit faster. So anyone else with questions on that? If you guys want, you can unmute yourselves. Questions at all about repricing? You guys are experts on repricing. Rustin says, hey, hey guys, please raise your hand. Yeah, I think you guys can't unmute yourselves. I think you have to like click on the raise your hand feature or if you have your camera on, actually raise your hand. I don't know if Liz has a question or not, but her, just, her camera just moved. Any questions about repricing? Raise your hand, guys. We'll get to you. Susanna says, recommendations for Scoutly settings. Yeah, I mean, 
for scout, least scout IQ, my recommendations in 2023, don't send anything under $4 profit. I would keep your profit high because you, you don't want to pay that $2 fee, that $2 removal fee, even on 10% of your inventory, that's going to hurt. So you, you at least want the chance of making $4 profit. Can your team set up reprice it? No, we currently don't do that. Plus, reprice it doesn't support the settings I mentioned. We reprice up at night, and that's why I use Channel Max. Channel Max also just seems to be a more powerful software. I, I literally doubled my units sold going from reprice it to Channel Max. So that's why I currently don't recommend reprice it. All right. Um, is it okay if I give you guys a special offer, one time offer for GoToLister today? Comment below. This is for people who currently aren't signed up and people who are signed up will also get this offer too. So comment one below if that's okay. Denise says, yes. We got a question from Chris. It says, do you have issues? Do you find issues with items being deactivated when pricing up? Yeah, you, a lot of your items will go deactive when you price up at night, but as long as you don't have minimum and maximum prices on Amazon, then when you price back down in the morning, they'll, they'll go active again. The issue you will run into is sometimes Amazon just won't let you price items higher, which sucks. In that case, you just got to price lower, you know? So Amazon's focus is to make the customers happy and provide items as cheap as possible. And sometimes we, we suffer as a result. How about seller toolkit? Repricer. Again, I went over my general repricing strategy. You can probably get most repricers to do this for you. Um, see if they have the option to reprice up at night. I don't know if they do. Don says one. Denise says one. JK says one. My sales increased after stopping reprice it. One thing that will happen after stopping any repricer is your sales can increase. And the reason for that is especially if you have rules to price up, if you're always pricing up, then you stop pricing up and now you're the lowest price, so you get more sales. So you usually get more sales when you start a repricer and when you stop a repricer, the days after. How does Channel Max compare to Aura? Channel Max is much more advanced, kind of like Scoutly. Scoutly is a very advanced app. It's very customizable. Channel Max is like that too. I'll also say Channel Max's support is amazing, and that's why I really like Channel Max. They'll answer my questions like within a couple minutes. All right, let's get into this. So when you sign up for GoToLister, you're getting the fastest listing workflow on the planet. If you guys don't believe me, hit me up. Like it's literally the fastest out there. There's not one that's as fast as GoToLister. You also get smart pricing. This could easily make you 300 plus per month. Again, I recommend looking at your batches before you submit the information. And GoToLister even tells you when it thinks that you should price the item higher. Sometimes GoToLister admits, hey, the software is not smart enough. It'll turn the book purple. It'll say no FBA offers. When that happens, open the book, use your best judgment, price it higher, get more profit. Profit analytics, you'll also get that. So you have a pulse on how your business is really doing. We also have downloadable reports. We're compatible with the tracking spreadsheet. You can download these reports and do other things with them as well. You can download batch data. You can download profit data, different things like that. You also get my complete repricing strategies for anyone who signs up anytime for GoToLister. This is, I charge 97 for it. I'll probably increase the price to a couple hundred soon, but we'll also set it up for you if you're not, if you're not, if you are tech, technologically challenged. So if you don't, if repricers freak, they freak me out guys, I'm 27. And it took me a long time to get over my fear of programming it. Cause like it's, it's sensitive information, you know, like if, if your repressor doesn't work right, you know, you could be losing money. That's why it's important to keep an eye, even when you do use channel max on, on what it does. Uh, it's very customizable and you can have it do different things for you. It's a $97 value. All this comes out to, let's see, 500, 600, $600 value. Sign up for free today, 14 day trial. And um, that'll also put you in the drawing for a chance to win $700 worth of giveaways, which is you'll have a pretty high chance of winning tonight because we only got 78 people on the call because I forgot to send the link out earlier. So 
go to lister.com. You can sign up. And uh, the limited time offer today, I'm going to take this away. You'll get my $400 course on how to sell books, start to finish, advanced strategies, beginner strategies, over 100 hours of content. This is a $400 value. This is only for people who sign up today. If you're already a go to lister user, just hit us up at support at go Say, give me the course, and we'll give it to you. Um, but this is going to go away tonight. So everyone who signs up today will get this for free. And I'm not sure when I'm going to give this away again, but currently uh, go to Lister users, get free access to this. All right, let's see. Are there still plans to make the missing dimensions easy workaround? Maybe currently just use Seller Central, unfortunately, and then 15 minutes should update go to Lister. I would also be careful if you're listing too many books with missing dimensions because those books generally tend to be higher sales rank. So just look out for that as well. Someone's asking about .ca soon, soon. I don't know when, but we got a few things we're doing and then, then we'll uh, expand to Canada. I know David wants that. All right, guys. And then also, if you guys want to go ahead and comment your go-to lister email below, then uh, we'll put you in the drawing for the $700 giveaway. How do we contact you at go-to lister? You can just contact us at support at go-to lister.com. Loved your Zoom with David, David Chung. Yeah, I appreciate that. Elizabeth is entering. So go ahead and Make sure you comment it, Elizabeth. I want to make sure my team can see that. You, you DM'd it to me. Everyone who's a user, comment. We got Amy, Leah, Marietta. Go ahead and comment that email. Put you, put you in the lineup for this $700 giveaway. We're giving away one Rolo printer. We're also giving away $500 worth of used books. We'll ship it directly to your house. Denise, Dennis. James. All right, we got about 15, 20 people. Guys, high chances, high chances of winning tonight. Tony, Emily. All right, so we do not have Steve joining us. He was going to talk about VAs. So I could pretend I'm Steve and shave my head and talk about VAs. Or we could just jump into general QA and then we'll uh we'll get Don up next because she'll be our first speaker. So, uh, option in Zoom. How do you raise your hand? If you click on, can someone test raise their hand? So I can fi find out if people actually aren't raising their hands or not. There we go. Chris, is that, is that a test or is that an actual? I'm going to ask you yourself, see if it works. Chris, do you have an actual question? Oh, now we got a bunch of people test raising their hands. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get any of you to unmute yourself. Anyone who has a question? Yeah, it's under reactions. Dennis, you got a question? How bad is my Wi-Fi? Is it pretty bad? Sincere, you got a question? Yeah, I do. What's up? First of all, how you doing today? Pretty good. How about yeah, yourself? Good. How's your week been with sales? Uh, really good this week, man. I actually meant to show that. Let me let me share my screen real quick. Um, so, one second. I think I'm at like I'm at fifteen thousand profit. My sales are only thirty thousand on this account. But uh, so we go to list. You can also do the last seven days. Five thousand profit. Eleven thousand sales. And this is mostly wholesale stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my question is um, about GoToLister because uh, we recently started using it over here. 
and um, we sent our first shipment out and we had a lot of um, books that were coming up um, Merchant McField instead of FBA. We don't sell Merchant McField for on Amazon. They were listing them Merchant Fulfilled? No, we were listing them FBA. And all the books were coming up. We never changed anything. It was all being listed FBA. And then all of a sudden, maybe the last batch, what well, came up all Merchant McField by the time we got to Amazon. That's, that's bizarre. I've never heard of that. Um, I'll message my developer tonight. If you could hit us up with like your login, uh, your email, just shoot us a uh, email support at GoToLister. We'll, we'll look in your account and see what's going on. Okay. Yeah, it was our first load. Um, one thing I noticed too is um, with when, when with the smart repricer or smart pricing, um, some of the some of the, some of the, some of the uh, pricing be outrageously high. Yeah. Uh, if you don't review it before you actually uh, submit it, uh, you will get. That book will be stranded. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. So we like to price on the high end rather than the low end because the other the other way is you lose money. But yeah, I like to always go through the batch before and just make sure there's no like crazy prices. But um, depending on your repricing strategy, you know, we start matching buy box fairly early, like within 30 days. So it would catch it would catch that. But, right, um, yeah, we just go by ROI. We use be cool. We just go through ROI because we know we, yeah. we need to do based on what we spent. Um, I have one last question. I don't want me to hold everyone up from their questions, but um, my last question has to do with restrictedinventory.com. Yeah. Um, when you get a batch from uh, one of the vendors, um, how long? You don't list all the books at the same time. Generally, we do. So what we do is we open up the box, list everything. We check for counterfeits. We check for unsellable books, unprofitable books. But if you scan it into the website, it should we should list it. But sometimes people send us crap. And then um, if everything's good, we list it either Merchant Fulfilled or Amazon FBA, depending on which one's more profitable. So there is a significant uh, lag in when it will update on restricted inventory. And that's because we use a partner who only sends us data every two weeks. Gotcha. So it could take up to really up to two weeks just for us to update our website. Oh, know? okay. Well, yeah. I, we have inventory been waiting over a month and we, it, it says only two, two books were listed out of everything we sent. Wow. Um, all textbooks. Yes. All textbooks. Yeah. I mean, well, in that case, they either were sent FBA, which would be good news, and then that would delay it another two weeks before, because we don't get data until it's active FBA. So if you shipped it to us, the two could be active MF right now, and everything else could be sent to FBA. So then we would get FBA data whenever that goes active, if that makes sense. The mm -hmm. other scenario would be their counterfeits and we didn't we didn't list them so um it's more likely to be that fba scenario i mean you got to because we would get the notification if it was right even though we checked it ourselves for counterfeit we would get a notification if it yeah didn't yeah we're, we're actually working on that system so currently no but um eventually yes we're working on building like a database of the reasons why books aren't listed i used to have like an in-house operation and we would let you know like immediately but with these uh with our new partner it's a little different Gotcha. Thanks, Robert. Hundred percent. What's up, Carlos? I'll ask you to unmute yourself. How we doing, Carlos? Maybe not. <laughs> What's up, Matthew? Matthew's one of our speakers. How you doing tonight? Good. How about um, yourself? I got a I'm doing good, man. I'm excited about tonight. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. So I got a question on the um, restricted inventory uh, listings. So have you seen or does it happen often where you do have a book that is restricted where Amazon says it's unable to be listed at some point does become available to list? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a general uh, trend with all categories on Amazon. Usually it's more of a trend with other categories other than books. There's a bunch of different book type of restrictions. You have brand restrictions, which would be like American Girl Doll. You have category restrictions, which they don't really consider this a category, but it's like popular textbooks. That's another uh, risk. McGraw Hill can allow you to request approval, but the one that you're going to be really hard pressed to get ungated in is Pearson. Pearson. And Cengage. Um, but especially Pearson. Pearson's a really hard one. Um, there, there's just certain textbook categories that the only way you can truly get ungated, a lot of people don't talk about this, you would have to become part of EPEG best practices. And that's, you know, a several thousand dollar investment. Right. Because you have to buy brand new textbooks to, to compare against uh, for authenticity. So like what a counterfeit book is versus a new book, you have to be able to compare all the books you're listing to a real copy of the book. So um, most, most books you can get ungated in, uh, except for the restricted textbooks. And it's almost a blessing in a sense to be restricted in textbooks because the law firm does test buys. And if they find out, if they do a test buy and say you're selling counterfeit books, your account can get shut down. They can ask for money. And right. so if you are restricted in textbooks, you're probably, you're not going to get test buys. So it's good in that sense. Okay, then I'm going to be sending you a bunch. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I did a bunch of e I did a bunch of uh, uh, eBay to Amazon flips, and of course they were good when I bought them. Got them, went to list them, restricted. Yeah, yeah, that happens sometimes. Pearson for all Amazon accounts, the first time you request approval, it'll say ungated, and then like two minutes later you'll be restricted. It's like a I weird. Think they might be Pearson too. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Look forward to talking with you soon. Matthew's one of our speakers down in Florida, Florida, right? Firefighter doing 5,000 a month. So, um, all right. Other questions, Don, you ready to rock and roll? You ready to go a little bit early? Let's see if she's still in here. Yeah. Ask you to unmute yourself. Let me know if you're good. If, if not, I can keep Q and A rolling for a little bit. I'm good. I just had to move. Okay, perfect. So we have Don tonight, who's like, all the speakers are doing over five thousand. I think she's seven thousand the last thirty days. All right, you ready? Yep. Okay. So welcome, Don. She's doing seven thousand a month. She's uh, she's been doing books for what about six months now? Yeah, I started in October. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Take it away. All right. So I'm Dawn. I live in Massachusetts, which is a great thing because we have a lot of colleges and a lot of really nice towns where I can go and source my books. Um, and I'm not afraid to travel, so, so that's good. Uh, but I started actually online 24 years ago, selling on eBay. And, um, and over the course of that time, I had um, five children. So when my kids were young, I would bring them with me and go on an adventure. And, um, but over time we ran out of space for storage and I, I went back to work. I worked at night. When my kids were little, my husband would come home and we'd be like passing ships in the night. And then when my youngest went to school, I, I started working during the day. And so it was last year, last summer, um, I checked in with my brother who also sells on eBay I said, how's the eBay going? He says, well, actually I've been having a thousand dollars profit every day on Amazon. I said, what, what is this all about? So I, I signed up and I started doing retail arbitrage. I went to, you know, the TJ Maxx, Marshalls, all that, it was fun. And um, I kept seeing all these people that are making so much money selling books. And I, I just, I couldn't get it. I didn't understand how it worked. So I decided that was my mission. So I watch a lot of YouTube videos and um, I joined Facebook groups and I think I, they had me on speed dial at Amazon. I asked so many questions, but I finally, I got started and I went to some libraries, Goodwill, like independent thrift stores, book sales, garage sales, yard sales, estate sales. And I just 
sent a lot of stuff in. And at the time I was using Seller Central. So I would have all my books and I'm not even sure how I figured out which ones to send and which ones not to send. And then I was using a regular printer. So if you can picture all these stacks of books and I'm packing the box and then I'm printing my 30 up. So then I'm unpacking the box. Then I'm doing like hide and seek to find the book. I'm packing the box again. It was crazy. So um, I decided I'm gonna spend a little bit of money. So I got Scout IQ, which was a game changer and go to Lister, which took it totally to another level because now I was super fast. So in the uh, Q4, um, my sales were 10,000. So I thought that was pretty awesome. And then January came and the stock limits came and everything came to a screeching halt. They told me my limit was 1,000 when I already had 1,300 in, in that Amazon. So I paid to have 4,000 books returned, which wasn't too bad then, it was only 50 cents a book. And then I decided I'm gonna start doing cherry pick method. So my goal was to um, only buy books with a $10 profit. And so um, now I didn't have that excess inventory that I had to return. So, you know, my uh, profits were higher because I was not buying as many as I bought before. And um, so March, March was 4,000 and April was 7,000. Um, was an, and also, you know, I, I know Avery mentioned that, you know, so I have the five kids and I work four days a week. So this is only me doing it maybe 10 or 20 hours a week. And I always send in between five and 10 boxes a week um, because they say you just, you got to keep feeding the beast. And the more you send in, the more um, the algorithm is going to work in your favor. Um, I try not to go under 10 unless it's a really high E score. So if it's a 151 plus, I'll go down to about $5. But I've been known to send in a whole box of 151s that I, I don't make that much money on, but has done wonders for my IPI score. Um, all right, Avery, what else can I talk about? Whatever you want. Uh, um, I mean, think. you're doing this part time and you're getting really good results. So, uh, just yeah. I'm sure we got some questions coming in too, so we can roll with okay. some Q and A. Uh, okay. Susanna says, "I'm a, I'm a homeschool mom of five. How homeschooling is a good opportunity to to get books." Uh, yeah. Says, oh, I'm, I'm going nuts. I'd love some mentorship. Yeah. Um, time management. So I just started my YouTube channel today. And so I'm going to share that and you can reach out to me, but yeah. the people- We'll drop the link below. So if you yeah. guys want to join, uh, go subscribe to her. Let's get her up to 10, 15, 20. There we go. That'd be Everybody awesome. Get up to 50 at least. We got, we got 78 people here. Awesome. Yeah, my friends at home school are generally extremely organized. And, you know, you only need- you know, a small pocket of time that you can go out shopping. So say like your husband's home on the weekend or you have childcare on the weekend, go out for a few hours and get your books. And then, you know, find pockets of time during the week. Like when your kids are napping, if they're younger or, you know, they're doing homework or whatever the case may be that, that you can do that. Like for me, I, um, I go shopping on my day off and on the weekends and then my youngest child is nine. So once he goes to bed, I, you know, sit in front of the TV with my boxes of books and I watch TV and I have my little bit of alone time and it's very enjoyable. And they know me very well at the UPS store. I'm there every day. Um, and it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm single traveling the world and I feel like my business takes all my time. So seeing someone do this, you get to you know even just a couple thousand a month is it's impressive yeah anything just to kind of make your life a little more comfortable you know you're not like worried about you want to go out to dinner or you know you have a big family and you go out to dinner it's like two hundred dollars you know just to be able to kind of live a little bit yeah 
Elizabeth says, uh, Don, you had started with retail arbitrage, but did you drop that when you started going with books? The thing that I like about books is that I generally almost never pay more than $2 a book, so, sometimes three. But um, if you buy an item for a book for a dollar, right? And it sells for 20, 30, 40, $50, or say it doesn't sell, you lose a dollar. The thing about retail arbitrage is the cost up front is a lot more. And, you know, say you buy 10 of a certain item and it doesn't sell, you kind of have more of a, it's more of a risk factor. I have kind of looked into, um, I was just reading this question. I, I have kind of looked into doing OA. I'm not really ready for that yet. I, I'm really enjoying the books. Here's another one. Do I have success in life? So I jokingly call my favorite source is my secret store. I will never tell anybody where it is, but I was sitting in my car waiting for my son at practice and I just Googled thrift store near me. And it is an independent store and it is a cash cow. And I, I always do very, very well there. Um, but I, I really like libraries. Um, the best and then the little tiny independent bookstore, um, just not bookstores, but thrift stores. I really don't like Goodwill because I think they're too expensive and um, Savers is, is like doubly so. So I go for the independent stores and the libraries, library sales, yard sales and um, estate sales. Yeah. Yeah, anytime you can get away from like what everyone else is doing. Yeah. If, you know, if, if you go to an estate sale, your competition is only the people at the estate sale that day. So if you're the first to the estate sale, then you're, you're basically scanning books that have never been scanned before. But if you go to a thrift store on a Wednesday and they haven't restocked in a week, then you're scanning leftovers. You know? mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't mention back door, back room access. Okay. What, everywhere I go, I talk to all the other scanners and all the people at the library. And they just, they love my story. And I tell them I have five boys and this pays for hockey, this pays for their college books, you know, and they, they want to help me. And I have access to some back, you know, back room at the library. Um, I think it was two weeks ago, I went to the, I went to the library and um, I, I got there two, after they closed, but their back room was open and I saw a $50 profit book. And um, I, I went back, you know, the next time they opened and I was able to grab that book, but they, they have, so many um like variety of, of prices that was um that was like a business book and another thing i always check children's i don't really i don't scan them really i call it i call it like um eye sourcing because i look with my eyes but you can look you can see um sets of children's books like i've sold american girl or another really good thing to look for is pop-up books. So I've gotten some really good pop-up books that sell for $25, $50, you know, and, and the children's books are cheap, like 25 cents. So those are always a good deal. Yeah. Childcraft books too. Harry Potter sets are actually profitable. Yeah. If you, if you can get them for a reasonable price, right? You, but you can sell those for 50 plus, especially the hard covers. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we got Carlos raising his hand let's i'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and then after that i'll get gerald what's up carlos hey good good sorry my bar before um i had a mic uh soon uh with the mic uh completely up a uh, quick question um this is my second day on my account uh and i'm doing book pick up book from uh from facebook stuff like that what I do, what you recommend me to do for those books that I do not want, or doesn't have the price that I really want to sell, or, or the one that is like not profitable book. What you what you try you to do with those book? So you're saying like from a donation? Oh, okay. No, no, no. You like where? Where are these books? Did you buy them already? Are you going through like a pallet? Oh. No. No, those some those one I just go on Facebook, for example, and okay, gotcha. people are like donating. Me. So I'll I let, can, for example, Don. right now, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll what let you do that. So, what do you do with your? Dad? What do I do with my dad? Yes, it's done. 
Yeah. Um, I do a lot of things. Um, I try to donate to like um, retirement communities or um, just different charities that that would benefit from them, like a you know um, a children's charity. I, I do the retirement communities a lot because a lot of them they just they don't have fresh material. And so like one one man said, you know, I've read every book in this library twice. And it just gives them a little bit of variety. And um, and then the ones that I really just can't get rid of, um, I do take, there's just like a book drop off. I, I put them in there, but I do try to give them to someone who can use them first. Sorry, I was eating pizza. Yeah. If, <laughs> if you do take them to a library or a thrift store, don't take them to the one you shop at. Yeah, that, yeah, that's good advice. Um, okay, Jerry. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. Good, uh, I'm Jerry from California and enjoyed so far the, uh, the session. I'm brand new to the book business, but I've been a collector for 25 years. So, um, and this, my, my questions could be to, to the audience in general. By the way, the young woman from Massachusetts uh, really liked her comments uh, in terms of how to use your time and where to pick up the books. I can confirm that. I have a large library, basically art books, academic titles, philosophy. Do they sell? Are you asking me? Yeah, or anybody. Yeah. Yes. Oh, please. yeah. I, I don't do any of those books. Um, okay. Someone actually had a, at one of the libraries, they hooked me up with someone who had a large collection of like, just like collectible books. And um, that's just not for me because they don't usually have ISBN numbers and there's a lot of research and there's many different kind of copies of the same book and you want to make sure you have the right one. And then they may take a long time to sell and it's just not for me. I, I prefer the, the quicker flip, even if it's less money. Sure, okay. Any of us have comments on that uh, figure library I have? You, you said, what, what type of books were you asking about? Uh, art books, philosophy, academic titles. Gotcha, yeah, we got uh, MGI raising your hand. Do you have a question? Do you have a comment on that, MGI? Let's see if she... And these books are not uh, what? Uh, what's the what's the word your folks are using? Uh, um, bogus. And some of these titles were purchased uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. We got David here. And all of them have ISBN numbers. Any any comments? Thank you. It's uh, uh, Gerald. You mentioned art books. Yes. Um, maybe. Um, personally, I don't scan those because I I don't find a lot of opportunity. The uh, you said philosophy, I think, was one you said. Yes. Uh, I would be over all over those because I've found some of those to move for decent money. Okay. Uh, academic books. Um, the problem with those is they get reissued at times. So they, they sort of lose sellability. But, you know, on the other hand, depending on who the author is. Yes. So, so I'm going to give you a hard and fast maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, the academic titles span areas like science, could be ornithology, could be physics, could be biology. So, so your bird books, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, is that a joke or not? <laughs> no, like seriously, it's like some, some of them do, some of them don't. So. Yeah, the ornithology, I was really, I found a few at a very great price actually at 70 cents. And uh, I was um, t totally surprised as when I checked out the uh, the price that's available. One last question for anybody that has comments, eBay versus Amazon. I think eBay has more control in terms of the seller. If that's not true, correct me. Amazon has a lots of uh, ins and outs and traps. Any, any comments, please? Amazon just has so much more traffic. That's why it's hard to compete with Amazon. That's why like uh, eBay and Amazon flips exist. Steve's uh, crushing right now i was looking at his go-to lister account the other day he's got like 
10,000 profit literally just from buying items from eBay and flipping them on Amazon. Is there potential on eBay? 100%. I'm doing this wholesale deal right now. And I'm like, where, where else can I sell these products? And I went to sell them on eBay. And they sell like once or twice, one or two units a week. And then on Amazon, they'll sell hundreds, if not thousands of units a day for one of these. Okay, so, so Amazon just okay. has, so much, it's just got so much demand. So like the, as a bookseller, Amazon is like the cream of the crop. It's like the top eBay second. And if, if you want to, you can, you know, if you're doing MF, you might as well list on eBay too. And then after that, I think it's like Abe Books, Alibris. I don't even sell on those websites, but I've heard both guys talk okay. about them. That's yeah. my two cents on that. No, I appreciate that honest information as a really big beginner uh, and just looking. I also have other business to take care of. So I'm looking at the time constraints that I have and, and of course, profitability. Thanks for the comments, folks. Appreciate it. 100% appreciate you, Jerry. Hey, All Adrian. Right. Yeah. What's up, um, Lydia in the comments was asking about uh, library sales and if they have the library markings. So I just wanted to answer that. Yeah. Okay. So in general, library sales are books that are donated. And so they don't have the library markings. I'd say like 90% maybe more, I don't know, but then some of them do have the library markings with it. And um, you just put that in your comments. I, I do um, condition mine as um, acceptable. And I say former library book with usual stamps and markings. Oh, and Avery, can I just talk a little bit about conditioning? I forgot to go into that. 100%. Right. So when I first started selling books, I mean, this is so funny looking back. I spent so much time conditioning books, like hours and notating like there's a scratch on page 10, uh, this page is turned down. Then I would take pictures of them. Then I would, you know, like I said, do my 30 ups and then I would put the stickers on them and then I would poly bag each book. Isn't that crazy? Did you hear? Did you hear me? I'm going to say it again, just so you can hear me. So when I started, I spent so many hours conditioning. You heard me, and I would I would condition them and make notes about every page and take pictures, and then I would poly bag every single book. Yeah, yeah. Some people still do that. There's crazy people that poly bag books out there. And um, another thing I want to say is like now I condition every so. I, that's when I did that. Then I got my first feedback, which good, and then I got two bad feedbacks. One said I sent a paper copy when it was a hardcover, which, you know, that could be an easy mistake. But the other one said that it was a textbook and that some of the tests were um, filled in, which I, I know was not true because I, I inspected all my books. So after that experience, I switched to um, conditioning everything that's good, no matter what. Unless, for example, like some of my libraries get donations of brand new books and I'll buy like 10 of them and I'll do them as like new because they are like brand spanking new. Everything is good. It covers a multitude of sins. You don't have to make specific notes unless it's something extreme. I just have a generic note that I do and it says good. And that way, you know, you're covered if any, any there's like, if anybody has to complain, it's like, it's all covered under that, that condition note. So this is like new right here. Good is here. Some listing softwares, like they make you do, you know, um, but you can just easily toggle uh, right here. And I do everything is good as well. And we use a generic satisfaction here. MGI, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. How you doing? 
I'm doing good. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to, to drop off and then I'm going to come back a little later because I have to get to work. I have like one hour of work left. So I'll yeah. probably catch the last, the last half hour. Get back but... here for the giveaway. You got to be here live to qualify. Okay, great. All right, great. This is my first time catching it. I get all your emails. It's fantastic. You've been very helpful, even though it's my first time meeting uh, you and everyone. I'm so happy to see that there is at least one person here from Canada. I'm in Ontario, Canada as well. And um, my children love books. And so I love books along with them. And so book selling is something that I'm passionate about, want to get a little bit more into. But I'm having, I'm new as well, but I'm having a really hard time with the restrictions. It's like almost everything I'm restricted in. And so that's been really, really tough. Has anyone else had that experience? I have with my mom's account. So this is what I recommend you do. I recommend going and typing in 100 or top 100 publishers. Really like it's, it's just frustrating, but you can take, you can upload a website like this, like TK, TCK Publishing. And then one day, like maybe like when you're watching Netflix or something, just take all of these and then go to, or if you're using GoToList, right? In Canada, we don't offer it yet, but if you were, you can do this on Seller Central as well, but type it in and then you would have to request approval. This account can't sell textbooks. So let me pull up a textbook as an example. So biology. 11 uh what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to put it in the error queue here mm-hmm. and then you can quickly apply for approval so actually no for some reason it's letting me sell that book biology 11 it's frustrating eventually it will go away so okay you no know, i can't sell this well, book will it go away on its own or it will go away as i continue to sell other things It'll, it'll go away as you continue to like grow and sell. So like the more books you list, the less likely they are to require you to. Uh... So here you can just click on apply. And if, if I clicked on that, it opens up Seller Central. It automatically puts in the ASIN and then it'll, you can request. Now what, what I would do if I, if I were you is just keep listing and then every time there's a book that you have to request approval for, just go through the motions. And then yeah, one day, you know, it'll go away. But it, it's, it's really frustrating. My mom still has to deal with that a lot. Yeah, I, I don't mind that part of it. It has the restrictions. I'm going through the motions. There's most of them that I'm getting the approval for. But what's happening is once I get that approval and I go back to try and list that book, then it's giving me the red restricted product tag there and I'm not able to list it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's called red restricted. Like, okay, is it it saying we're not accepting applications or is it saying request approval with the invoice? No, it's, it's saying you've been, it's successful. Congratulations. It's successful. And then I refresh and then the red restriction comes up from most of them oh hmm. that's frustrating yeah yeah I, how, how many what percentage of your books is this uh, well it is so much till i can literally tell you that out of 200 books that i have gotten already that i didn't realize that i was restricted to that point on there there's only three of them that I could actually post to sell. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, are you in the group chat? Yes. Yeah, I would bring this up. Oh, when you group say group chat, chat, do you mean, what do you there's, mean? There's a group chat on Facebook that we're all in. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I would ask in there. And okay. See if overcame this. I, I was talking to a lady last week who was dealing with the same exact issue. So it could be okay. something to do. Uh, okay. It's probably my answer is the same. Like just try to sell more books. Like the more you sell, the more likely Mm -hmm. Amazon is to open up. uh, Got it. Okay. All right. Great. That's been helpful. It's nice to meet everyone. I'm going to drop out, but I'll be back a little later. Sounds good. Everyone give Dawn a a big, a lot of love in the chat. Drop a one uh, for her, all her knowledge she dropped. Thank you, Avery, for having me. Yeah, hundred percent. We got David, Matthew, Susanna, 
Yvette. Joji, you better drop a one. I know he's in here somewhere. All right. Um, Gerald, did you have a question for Jerry? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, just a quick question. The relationship between pricing and condition, hearing uh, the young lady's comments, uh, labeling everything good, what happens to a new book or a light new book? You wanna answer that, Don? Yeah, okay. I wouldn't list a book new for anything unless I specifically had the invoice from the distributor. And even with okay. like new, I have a lot of books that I consider like new. It's not what everyone else considers like new. There might be like a little dent here and there or a page folded. Mm -hmm. Like I've just been there and done that and I do everything is good. Unless, like I said, the libraries that get the donations of the brand new books, I'll do those like new, but I've learned and I've been conditioned, ha ha ha, to do all my conditioning as good. And it's, it's, it just works for the best. How does that affect your pricing though? It doesn't actually make that big of an impact. I mean, Avery can speak to that because I, I you know, worked through this with him. It really doesn't make a big impact, especially when you go in for the buy box. Um, if, I'm, if I'm saying this correctly and the buy box like rotates, um, it doesn't always go to the like new over the good or the very good. And I think um, like Avery was saying about how Caleb did that experiment with the two boxes of books. I think that somebody, maybe Caleb also did the same thing he with same conditioning. He listed all the books acceptable and he listed a bunch of books. Uh, I think it's like, I don't know, like just all conditions. And he found out like the sell through rate was the same on each. So that suggested that it doesn't have a huge impact if, if you condition the books. Uh, somebody says, how do I stop echo feedback? Does everybody hear an echo? Okay, cool. Forgot what I was talking about, acceptable yeah. book. Joji, do you have any insight on that? By the way, Joji's got the, I'm so jealous of you right now, man. I got, uh, I got this Colombian sweatshirt, but he's got the go-to Lister swag. I don't even have my own go-to Lister swag. It's in the States. Let's go. Look at that, buddy. I mean, it's backwards, but it looks I, nice, though. Good yeah. fit. It's a merch no, by Amazon, right? Coming out, uh, same for us. I, I, it says go-to Lister. That's not backwards. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah, I don't think too much that condition matters when it comes to, at least from the data that I've seen, the condition really mattering much in terms of winning the buy box and therefore getting sales. But that's well, just my, my own... Mean? Yeah. Plain devil's advocate. I know when I buy books, sometimes I'm like, all right, I'm gonna buy this like new book. And I usually buy merchant fulfilled. And so like, I know Amazon too. Like I know price history. It's like, I'm like, before I purchase stuff, I'm like looking at the key book because it's already open. And like, you know, like if I see a like new book versus a good book and it's like the same, I'm going to buy the like new. So I, I do think that maybe there is a potential for a, a quicker sell through rate if you do list like new. But that being said, I've never seen like data to, to back that up. There's actually data that says that it's not true. So yeah. I think it just, I think it just comes down to, again, winning the buy box. I think most people are not very savvy when it comes to buying anything on Amazon. So I think most people will just buy through the buy box. So the question is, are you more likely to win the buy box if you're in acceptable or if you're in very good condition or like new rather than acceptable condition? I totally agree with you that if someone actually is going through a listing, like let's say there's a suppressed buy box and they're looking at acceptable, good, very good, probably a logical human being is going to pick a very good condition over an acceptable condition, but they might not see those options when they yeah. have just acceptable in the buy box. They just buy it right. or don't buy it. Yep. Agreed. Cool, cool, cool. All right, Don, appreciate you so much. Uh, anything else, Jerry? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, two things come up. When I'm buying books from any source, including Amazon, um, I always look at condition. Yeah. And I would always pick, I would always pick like new over very good, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm looking at pricing and price doesn't matter, I'll buy new. That's just the way I am. So when I, when I translate that to selling, it seems to me uh, I'm, I'm listening to the data that you presented and it doesn't totally convince me that we should label everything good. 
uh, that just smacks of lowering the price of the book. If that's incorrect, yeah, you, please you, correct you me. You could also look at the cost benefit analysis. Like if it takes you a long time to condition okay. them, then then you're wasting you know an hour versus maybe you could list all the books in 15 minutes and then spend the next 45 minutes finding more profitable books. That would be the argument there. Okay. A lot, last question. What does buy box mean? That's a term I'm not familiar with. All right, I'll show you real quick. So if you look at my screen, what I, what I recommend doing before you submit your batch on GoToLister is scroll through, look at the prices. And then again, we'll give you alerts if we think you should price the book higher. We'll turn it purple if there's no FBA offers. And we turn mm -hmm. it like orange if there's no offers at all. So if there's no offers at all, you can basically price the book at whatever you want. So let's, uh, let's open up this book here. This is a Jewish set. I sold this for two thousand dollars. I paid right. four hundred bucks for it. Um, the buy box is right here. Amazon is allowing a buy box at four thousand dollars for this product. Okay, tell me that's not price gouging. I sold this for two thousand. I'm jealous. It's selling for four thousand. So this is the buy box. This little box here. This is the buy gotcha. box. Now, okay, thank you. What we know as sellers, because we're always looking for deals, our brains are different because we're entrepreneurs, we're always looking for the cheapest. And so we look for others. So other offers here, we could we could save ten dollars by buying this. Like actually, we're not even we're saving five dollars because it's four dollars shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, like new. Now sometimes the price here is like ridiculously low. You'll see people selling for like a penny sometimes. Yes. And then Yes. $3.99, you pay $4 total and you get it. Or you could pay $10 and get the prime shipping, which some of us will do that. We have a lot of people in here who do have a prime membership. And then some of us would rather just save the money. We're not in a rush to get the book. So, um, but buy box, it, it, it's just more eyeballs are on this, more clicks. It's going to get more sales. Thanks. Appreciate it. 100%. All right. Uh, Matthew, you ready to rock and roll? I believe you're up next. All right, so Matthew's out of Florida. Uh, he's doing over 5,000 sales a month, right? Somewhere in that range. And uh, he's a firefighter, which is pretty cool. He sent me a fire truck. And uh, he's gonna talk about um, building relationships, correct? Or getting free books. What was your, I'll let you introduce the, the topic. Okay, hi everybody. Um, as Avery said, um, I'm Matt from Florida. Um, I've been a firefighter for 20, Two, 23 years now, time flies. Um, I started uh, looking at the um, Amazon route probably about a year ago. No, longer than that, two years ago, um, when I had quit a second job. I was, as a firefighter uh, in South Florida, we work 24-hour um, shifts, so we're off 48 hours, so most of us have a second job of some sort. And I've worked a second job for over 20 years, um, working as an instructor, teaching EMT and paramedic students. And then I progressed on to uh, running a school. I was a director of a school. And it just became beyond time consuming. I was putting in more time at the school than I was at the fire department. Um, I, not too long ago, uh, got remarried and um, I'm one of those dirty old men from South Florida that have a younger wife, and I also have a 16-month-old. Um, so I started all over with kids, and it's actually been great. She's amazing, uh, keeping me young, keeping me running around. Um, but I, I needed something else to supplement that income that I lost when I quit the second job. So I started seeing all these reels popping up with... Um, uh, Stephen Rankin and uh, this guy Avery talking about selling books and how they're doing so great. And I'm like, man, this, this can't be real. This can't be true. So I started looking more into it, started doing more research. And uh, it seemed like something that I could at least give a try to that it wasn't going to be too uh, financial, too much of a financial burden to, um, to jump on in and uh, give it a try. Um, one of the best things I like about books is I've tried the um, online arbitrage. I tried retail arbitrage. I, I do okay. I find a couple things here and there. Uh, but one of my 
favorite things about books is if I spend a dollar or $2 on a book, I get home, go to list it and I can't list it or it's a book that I got to send back. It was a dollar I lost. I'm not losing $10. I'm not losing $50. It's a small investment that I made and I lost that small investment. I, I spend more than that going to Starbucks in, the, in a day, you know? Um, so I jumped into the book thing and um, I started scanning everything and anything that popped up green, I was sending it in, I was selling it, I wasn't being picky, I just needed inventory in there because everything that I saw said, feed the beast, send the boxes. Um, I will say that one of the things that I learned pretty quickly was the more inventory you had, the better your sales were. And from there, I just set goals each week three to five boxes a week I was sending in and I'm maxing those boxes to 48, 49 pounds. I'm getting as close to 50 as I could get. So I'm sending in these boxes and I'm doing okay. I'm hitting the thrift stores. Then I started noticing um, as many of you have that the Goodwill books, if I'm finding them at Goodwill, they're really low profit. And the price at Goodwill started going up from a dollar a book, $2 a book, $3 a book. So I'm like, okay, well, I got to start finding some other sources. Um, I'm in the Fort Lauderdale area and um, there's a lot of people doing books around here. So my availability of going to some of these uh, thrift stores and sourcing books, I would go there, I'd spend an hour, two hours scanning and I'd walk away with like three books. And I'm like, okay, this is not working. So I started driving an hour and a half to two hours to try and find other sources, Palm Beach County outside of my area. And I started doing better. Well, in doing that, one of the things that I started doing was not just going in, scanning books with my headphones in, turn around and walking out. I started talking to people, started talking to the salespeople, started talking to the manager, building relationships with these people. Um, I found that uh, libraries, which I didn't know when I first started, Libraries usually have a section called Friends of the Library, where they sell old books that they've discontinued from their um, uh, from the library itself, or donated books to the library. Which I didn't even know you could donate books to a library, but people do it all the time. Um, so I started going there, started talking to the people that run the Friends of the Library section, started building relationships with these people. One of the other things that are popping up on just about every other corner around here and probably in some of your areas as well are the bin stores. Um, they're taking all the returns from Amazon, from Target, from Walmart, turning around and selling them. Now, me personally, I'm not going in buying electronics and trying to resell them on Amazon, but some of the bin stores carry books. They carry media, uh, CDs, DVDs, uh, vinyl, which I found recently vinyl has been great. Um, but in going to these stores, started talking to the manager, started talking to the salespeople, again, building those relationships. And why I say most of this is, is important with building these relationships, as Dawn had mentioned earlier, which Dawn, you stole some of my thunder, um, building these relationships gets you backroom access. And that can be key to finding profit. You're getting backroom access to these products before they come out on the floor and get to scan them before anyone else has gone through and picked through them. Um, kind of like Avery was saying before, you can go into a thrift store on a Wednesday, they haven't restocked, you're going through whatever's left over from everybody that's scanned over the weekend. If you can get that backroom access, you get the access to scan these books before they even get out on the floor, you can find those books that have that $20 value. So building those relationships, getting access to the back room, being able to get back there and do these scans before they come out can be paramount to your business. Um, one of the big things for me that I recently did was build that relationship with one of the managers at the bin store. Uh, I have a bin store literally five minutes from my house. I've been going there for a couple months. I'd find a book here, a book there, nothing great. I started talking to the guy. Um, and the way our bin store works is I think it's Friday, everything's $12. And then each day it goes down by like two bucks. So I usually go in on Wednesday, which is $2 day, because I'm not spending five bucks for a book because most of the books and stuff they have were low profit. Um, so I would go in on $2 day 
and he would see me all the time and I would talk to him. I had mentioned to him about anything that he might have in the back. Sure enough, he took me in the back room. He had three bins of books and two bins of records. And I had never done vinyl. I hadn't even looked at vinyl before. I started scanning them and I found, you know, four or five, and these were all target returns or target clearance. Um, they have four or five of the records that were all of the same artist, and they were all like a 10 to $18 profit. I listed them last week. I had three of them sell before they even got through inventory. So this is another avenue that I'm looking at as far as the backroom access is being able to go in and scan other things besides just books that are in my realm. Um, one of the other things that I did was the friends of the library, I got to become pretty good friends with one of my local library um, managers, the friends of the library group. Uh, they have actually a very big friends of the library uh, area. And in talking to her, she had given me backroom access before. And, you know, a lot of people say stay away from fiction and sci-fi. Well, she had somebody that had donated their entire lifelong set of sci-fi books. It was literally over a thousand sci-fi books. Well, I found, I can't even, I don't even remember how many it was now. Um, probably a, at least 50 books, a couple of them sets. And I walked out of there, I think I paid like, $60 for everything. And I walked out of there with almost $600 worth of profit, potential profit. Um, so that was a great resource for me getting that backroom access, but building that relationship again with her. Now I'm doing consignment with that library. So she has books that she doesn't bring out. She waits for me or she'll shoot me a text. Hey, I got this new set in, come take a look. I'll go through and scan them. If it's anything that's over a $20 profit or potential profit, we'll do a consignment on it. So I'll take it, I'll list it. I'll give her 30%. I get 70% of whatever profits made on that book. That is a higher profit that she would get selling the book at the Friends of the Library store. And it generates more funds for the library because ultimately that's what the Friends of the Library group is for. Um, again, those relationships, getting access to a pre-library sale. So a lot of the libraries around here, they'll have the Friends of the Library group, but every other month or every quarter, they'll do a big library sale. So I've gotten access to some of these books prior to them even opening it up to the public to be able to go in, scan, and make purchases. Now, what I normally do with that is they'll sell the books for a dollar each. I offer a $2 profit each or a $2 sale. So if I get access prior to them doing the sale, I'll pay double what they're going to make on the books. But I also have my um, trigger set at a higher price range. So I have my trigger set to a $5 profit. So I'll go in there. I've already put in that $2 cost. So I know when I'm going in there, I'm not going to be losing money on that book. Um, so I don't mind paying the extra dollar. And then the same thing works with um, post sales. I just had a library sale that I went to uh, two weeks ago, um, left there with almost a thousand dollar profit on the first day, was talking with the lady running it. And she asked me, cause she saw me scanning everything else. We started talking and she asked, um, do I have anything that I do with books that I don't use? And I said, well, I have different avenues that I take care of getting rid of my books, duds as we like to call them. Um, she asked me if I would like to have any of the books that were left over after the sale. I said, absolutely. She calls me up on Monday because that was the end of the sale was Sunday. I wound up leaving there with $2,500 or 2,500 books for free. Now, granted, that's a lot of books to have to get rid of. Um, but I went through and scanned them. I wound up with $800 in potential profit from books that um, they were mostly teen and kid books, which I didn't really scan much when I was there. So none of the other scanners went in or scouters went in and scanned those either. So that gave me another uh, avenue of potential profit to go through. And it was all for free. Um, 
I know Don had mentioned the yard sales, the estate sales. Um, I actually go through Facebook Marketplace. I look to see if anybody posts a yard sale coming up or a garage sale or an estate sale. And I'll contact them and ask them if I can come in there the day before or two days before and scan what they have for books. Um, most of the time, I've, I've never, well, I shouldn't say never. I've had a couple of people that say, no, come on the day of. But a lot of people, they just want to get the stuff out of their house, whether it's two days before or the day up. So getting access to those books before anybody else is scanned, again, building that relationship, talking to people, contacting them, a simple email, a text, whatever the case may be, a message. How do you Facebook. present yourself? Because I know a lot of people are freaked out, you know, admitting that they sell on Amazon or they're a reseller and they feel like they should like kind of hide it. What's, what's your approach with that? I'm 100% straightforward with it. Um, and one of the things that I was going to bring up was um, another avenue that I utilize a lot is the Nextdoor app, Facebook Marketplace, um, um, OfferUp. I post ads on there for free book pickups. And one of the things that I get every single time is, well, what are you going to do with the books? And I'm straightforward with them. I, I tell them, I will be going through all the books. I'm going to scan them all. And maybe 5% of them, I'm going to turn around and resell to cover my cost of coming out, picking up the books for free. Um, but the majority of those books, and kind of like Dawn was saying, with getting rid of your duds, what do you do with them? I have three main thrift stores that I go to um, to donate the books. And I will tell you, kind of like Dawn said, I don't go to ones that I source at. These are ones that I've gone to prior to doing the donations. I found that they usually have nothing. They're usually picked through already. So they get all my duds. So if any other book sourcers in Fort Lauderdale or in my area, they probably have gone through these thrift stores and found nothing. And there's probably a 10,000 books that they've gone through. Um, sorry about that. But I have those three that I, uh, I mainly bring all of my duds to. Um, the Little library boxes, if you do a search on Google Maps, you'll see it'll say a little library box um, in your area at parks or whatever. Um, I'll actually go there and stop, restock the little library boxes. But it's also another avenue for me to scan some books that I never even saw. I will absolutely scan books in those little library boxes. If I take one or two, I'm replacing it with 10 to 15 new books. Um, then another thing that I started doing recently, which Dawn had brought up, is in the South Florida area, we have a nursing home on every other corner. I go, I've built relationships at these nursing homes. I'll bring my duds to them. They're more than happy to take them to give the um, residents there another uh, resource to keep them busy. So they'll usually set up a little library. I actually have two that I go in there and I'll go through and I'll set up all the books myself. Um, I'll put the books on their little shelf. I'll reorganize things. Um, it might take me, you know, 30 minutes of my time, but I feel like I'm doing something good for these residents. Plus it's given me another avenue to get rid of some of my duds. Um, but yes, when, if anybody ever asks, when I contact them, I tell them I am absolutely a book reseller. I'm looking to take these books and do something good with them. Uh, donating them to nursing homes, donating them to local donation centers. And I will take about 5% of those or less to recover my cost. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're like using your duds to build relationships with other people because they're duds to you. But a lot of times, like the fastest selling books on Amazon are duds to us, but they're like the, they're the most popular books. Harry yeah. Potter, you know, Lord of the Rings. Like these are the best books in the world but they're duds to us. The nursing home would love them. You know, yeah. you're providing value in a sense. Don't think just because they're duds to you that they're not super valuable to someone else. Absolutely. You someone know. was asking, what do you do for tracking your consignment? I actually, um, I utilize, and don't hate me for this, Avery. I utilize another uh, listing software. Oh my currently. God. Currently, currently. Yeah. Um, but what I do is when I put in my um, SKU, I list it as the name of the, the source. Like I have a few friends that bring books to me. So I have one friend, Nicole, 
in my um, SKU, I'll put coal and then whatever the number is. Um, if it's one of the libraries, I'll put like um, one of the libraries locally, WBL. I'll list as the SKU starting um, of yeah. it. That way I can track it easy on a search on yeah. Seller Central. Yeah, that's why we force people with go to lister to, to track their source. That way, you know, did you get it from Goodwill? Did you get it from your friend? Did you get it from the library? Did you get it from Walmart, wherever you got it from? Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's good. Um, does that factor in uh, inbound shipping costs? Do you know? What do you mean? Like, uh, you're probably using Inventory Lab, right? No. No? Scan well, what's Scan Lister? Yeah. Tells you, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't know the scam did, did that. Um, does it factor in, like, if you pack a box, ship it to FBA, does it factor in that cost or no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it'll show me, it'll show me the um, potential profit. It'll show me the cost of goods and it'll show me the FBA and those fees. Gotcha. Guys, raise hands if you got any uh, questions. Um, one of the other things I just recently started doing with um, kick me out. I just noticed that um, one of the things that I started doing recently was using book scouter on my duds to try and resell to like uh, sell back your book Powell's and those other places. I haven't sent anything in yet, but I just started doing that. I think David's talking about that, right? Yeah. David. Okay. I won't steal your thunder, David. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. And then one of the things that I learned from you, Avery, was um, this was before you started doing the boot camp. You started doing the smaller groups, or you were doing the smaller groups, and you talked about going to your local college and talking to professors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Being uh, an instructor at a couple of the local colleges, I just went back and started talking to some of the teachers I knew. Yeah. Um, and I got so many used textbooks given to me, oh, ones that were, you know, they're no longer the edition they're using anymore. And they were more than happy to get them off their shelves and make room. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. You can literally make like a couple hundred dollars profit, if not more, to go into a professor's room. Uh, their, their closets are just filled with yeah. gold. Yeah, they're, um, they're more than happy to get rid of those books. So real quick, I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Some people keep asking about the tracking. I think uh, Sincere was asking. So first of all, always put your buy cost in on whatever listing software you're using and then the source. So wherever you got the product from, then you can export this data. And the most accurate way to track consignments is with Caleb's tracking spreadsheet. So you open this up here and then you can just import this to the tracking spreadsheet. That's what we use to this day for restricted inventory um payouts and then we will be having some features like under profit analytics right now it just tells you your total profit each month and you can see your orders but we will be showing you like on a per source basis so we'll make it so you can do uh consignment payouts from from here as well so um that that's what we currently do for our consignment business so we just export this data upload it to the spreadsheet i like it yeah other questions for matthew if you guys have oh, questions. That's actually a good idea, Diane. The dumpster near the college dorms on move out day. Yeah. I thought about putting like a like a monster on a like artwork on a like a dumpster. You know, like you know the dumpster, like the library bin type dumpsters. Yep. They get like a monster eating the textbook. And so kids at the end of the semester would just love to, I would have loved to do that. Like, yeah, just trash it. I would throw it like in the dumpster. You're muted. I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, you're muted again. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> there we go. All right, I'm not touching anything. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> I'd tell Alexa to turn up the light. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> I, I thought you were trying to talk to me. Yeah, hey, I like that idea. I would love to do that at my son's college. Yeah. Yeah, you literally, if you just look in the like, actual trash during finals week, kids throw away their books. Yeah, it's that's crazy. You, you feel, I mean, you paid money for it, but at the end of the semester, you hate that thing. <laughs> Other questions for Matthew? Any questions at all?
Show Matthew some love, guys. Drop a one in the comments. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Hopefully, it helps some people uh, come out of their shell. I know some people are introverts, and you don't like talking to people too much. But if you want to make money, you got to talk to people. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's huge. Like the people that are, you know, building businesses out of this, they're talking to people for sure. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Yep, 100%. David, you ready to rock and roll? I think I have to ask you to unmute yourself. Unmuting. All right. We got David out of Canada. Oh, he's got the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. PowerPoint and PowerPoint and everything here. We'll be sharing volunteering at thrift stores. Uh, finding a book niche, I'm excited for that uh, because, you know, people talk about like what types of books should I sell? Can you uh, can you go to the next slide so I can cheat and read off those those points? Oh, yeah, right. uh, there you go. <laughs> USA, USA buyback services. That'll be nice that you can increase your cash flow by sending your dud books or even your good books. You know, maybe you're making $10 profit sending it to Amazon, but you can make $7 cash sending it to another company. You don't have to sell it on Amazon. He'll be talking about that. And then uh, never go anywhere without your scanner. So welcome, David. Let's give David some love. Put some twos in the chat for David. I got, I got twos, which is more than ones that other people Yeah, we just got to differentiate it so we know if they like you or Matt more. <laughs> we'll wait till the end, then we'll find out. So um, just a quick bit about me. Uh, I retired in 2021. So back in 2019, when I knew retirement was coming, I decided, what am I going to do to fill my time? So that's when I got into uh, watching Steve Raken, particularly, and uh, and Avery, of course. And I started to pick up, um, you know, the idea of selling books. So one of the topics that I picked up on is volunteering at a thrift store. So uh, to this day, I every Sunday afternoon I go to this this particular thrift store. It's one of four in a, in a city of about 40,000 people. So it's not particularly huge. And this is my, uh, my picture from last Sunday. And this is what I come into. And then of course, during the day Sunday, this, this area gets dumped in more. So I want to talk just about my experience of volunteering at a, at a thrift store as a book scanner, so that people can get an idea of, hey, is this something that I can do? Or, you know, what are the pros and cons of it? So I put up my, my advantages and disadvantages and you know, what's good for me and what's bad for me. And from the thrift store perspective, what's good for them that I'm coming in and what are the disadvantages? And they, they know up front that I'm there to scan books. I'm there to, to, uh, to buy books, but they're happy to sell books. So the main advantage for me is I, I have moved up the food chain. These are basically coming out of people's trunks and I am the first one to touch it. I'm getting books cheaper. I'm getting book uh, backroom access to other things that are a thrift store. And I get unlimited free cardboard boxes, which is great because what am I gonna do with these things? I'm gonna you know, put a label on them and ship them to Amazon. So the disadvantage for me is I'm touching the volume of duds that I'm either going to, you know, put on the shelf or I'm going to throw into a dumpster. And, you know, boxes or books are heavy. And we've talked about pushing that 48, 49 pound limit. No, people, some people blow past that. Um, another little disadvantage I have is I do have a boss, so I can't come and go as I please. But, you know, we have a good working relationship. Um, one of the things that I didn't write down here that I thought of afterwards is, the culture of the place that you work at is important. Um, I work at a, a place that's, I'm going to call fun. It's community that I see people all the time. I talk to people and that's very positive. Uh, from the thrift store perspective, they love me because I'm free labor. I'm cleaning out the book uh, area of dead inventory. It's not a headache for them anymore. And we're getting into the the idea of they have an on-site customer now that you know those rainy days where nothing you know there's nobody's coming and nothing sells you know they're starting to ask me now 
<laughs> you know, do you have any interest in these, you know, in these albums? Do you have any interest in these items? Um, the only other disadvantage for the, the thrift store is, uh, you know, there's sometimes I'm on vacation or, you know, uh, I'm not coming in. So they have to work out a plan to uh, uh, staff the area and clean it, clean it up. And I probably should have started with this story, but back in 2019, when I was scrounging around looking for, for sources of books, I came in and the uh, flipping back to the picture of the table, it was like two or three times bigger than this. And when I was talking to the, uh, the manager about what a mess, what a mess it was, they told me that the, uh, the fire department had actually been in and, you know, read the riot act to them about clean this up. So that's sort of how I started working there. So I'm going to fl flip forward now. Um, it's always nice to, to, to tell you some numbers about the, the experience. So what I did is I looked at some of my year 2022 results. Um, retail scanning is, <clears throat> that's where I'm at, at my, you know, my Goodwill locations, uh, Salvation Army, uh, the Value Village Savers. So retail, I'm on average here in Canada, I'm paying about three bucks a book. Um, when I'm at the thrift store, I'm a, I'm a bit lower. I'm at like a dollar, dollar twenty four. I'm selling them for pretty much the same on Amazon. My profit is higher because I'm paying less. So, in short, I'm trading my labor for a better buy price. So, backroom access. I I got a picture of a couple things that I've got. Uh, I've had in, in my, my little space here in uh, my house. I got an ACDC poster. I plan to flip that at Christmas. I got a bar clock, same thing. Um, a couple of beer signs, um, some uh, twiddle hockey games. Um, you know, through selling things on Facebook, I tell people what I do. And, you know, some people say, hey, if you ever see this, or, you know, hey, I was talking to you about. Uh, um hockey stuff you know i know you do books you know can you uh, can you help me out by taking books so it's you know it's broadening my market a bit about from books into other things so that's that's my thrift store experience so before i change topics any any comments or do you want to save it for yeah, if yeah. anyone, uh, I can read some comments real quick. Um, yeah. $5, blah, blah, blah. Why are your men profits so low at $5? What if the market tanks on those low profit books? I have my minimum profit figures at 12. I think that's really aggressive. Um, maybe Any opinion on that? So, I'm not sure where that, that $5 came from. Oh, so maybe, maybe it was a comment in the chat. Uh, yeah. yeah maybe, there have, maybe I'm reading a thread. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? If you guys want, you can raise your hand real quick. Someone's asked a scanner question. What kind of scanner do you use? Um, if, this, is, this, is good. It's, it's, this is a bomb question. Okay. So... For the longest time, I used an and one of the old EOYO blocks, and beautiful thing, you know, it's heavy, uh, you can't break it. Um, but uh, I put it down in a thrift store and I lost it. So then I bought myself a one of the, the new EOYO ones, and whoever calibrated that thing must have calibrated it on a Friday afternoon after coming back from a bar because I could stand there and point at the uh, the barcode and it wouldn't work so i returned that to amazon i bought a ring scanner and didn't like it so now i've got a natamu and i love that one you know what's funny i've never really used ring scanners i've heard people love them i was in cuba a week and a half ago and i so i <laughs> i ate some pork ended up getting food poisoning and i didn't oh. pay because I, they didn't accept my card for some reason. Yeah, I think I got poisoning as karma for for uh, not paying. 
but when I left, I was like, I feel so bad. Like I got, it was $27 worth of food in Cuba. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to pay this guy somehow. So I gave him my ring scanner. I just happened to have it yep. on me. I never use it. I just had it like in my backpack. Yep. Yep. $70 yo-yo ring scanner that they sent me. They wanted me to do a, a video on it like years yep. ago. And I just never did. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. I've never really used ring scanners, but there's yep. one in Cuba. So. First night I didn't like it, but to, to each as well. Yeah. All some right. of my some of my competitors here they they swear by them, but I'm yeah the people that like them really like them. I, I've never yeah. really tried it, but I think you know habits die hard. And like yeah. I kind of have like a weird scanning flow. It doesn't even really make sense. Like I'll put my phone like on the shelf and then I'll scan, and it's like it's obviously not the most effective way of doing it. But I'm just mm -hmm. I've done it for years. Right. Any any more? Or want me to move on? Yeah, we can open up Q and A at the end. But yeah, feel free to okay. go. So, um, I also volunteer at it in the city I live in. There's a there's a like a, a huge library sale. Um, it's starting again in July. They're taking donations July, August, September. So, I I'm planning on volunteering for that because I'm you know I'm retired. What else am I going to do? And one of the things I like about it is. I scan for books every day. And, you know, I am, you know, like I said, I am ahead of the food chain on this. I am walking out of there with, you know, 30 and $40 textbooks and spirituality books. And, you know, I'm just the cherry picking my way through life. So if you have a chance to do it, do it. All right. So on to book niches. So, we're going to discuss a little bit of a theory. So I, I created this graph. And what my point of this graph is um, books are popular at one point, And then over time, they fade away. And so do the sales. So I made the example here of in 2023, if like a book is published in 2023, it's not going to be incredibly popular until it catches on. So a lot of what we as booksellers are doing is we are we're fighting for sales in the yellow area of say books that were published last year or the year before and then there's a point in time where books aren't popular enough so as booksellers we we sort of lose interest so to me there's there's two possible niches there of books that are published in 2023 or books that are a couple years old that aren't selling as often. So I got two examples of these are books I picked up this week. So this first book, uh, Golden Doves, it's one of the World War II romance uh, fictions. So I see this book on the, the shelf at a thrift store, beautiful condition. Um, and I'm looking at it going, you know, why, why is this sitting here? And then I, I looked at my screen and uh, it's, you know, it's got a 4,000 sales rank. So I think well, that's pretty good. So I open it up and it was published in 2023. So when I look on, you know, in Amazon Canada, right now it's Amazon and two other sellers new. So no use competition. So to me, that was one I grabbed and i I've got that in my uh, my next box going in. The opportunity book on the right, this one uh, sells six times over the last six months. So in Scoutly, I do a live search, brings me back to keep a chart. I could look and say, hey, it's it's selling me once a month. Um, Looks like because I'll be the only FBA offer, I can probably write my ticket in the neighborhood of 40, 50 bucks. So I thought those were two niches. And the only reason that um, I've, I've identified this is because I'm watching my screen as I'm scanning. And it's like, hey, there's, you know, there's no use competition. And I'm FBA. I'm, I'm, I, have, I have a chance here. So. We'll talk, talk more about that in, uh, in QA afterwards. Uh, USA buybacks. But to me, this is another, this is an interesting topic because, because I'm in Canada, I've got a border in the way. So I, have, I had three challenges in order to, to sell books to a USA 
buyback service. You know, do I live close enough to a cross-border shipping location? Like this is in this case, it's, there's Stellion Express is one which is it's about a half an hour on the highway away. That's okay. That's doable. Um, the second challenge I had is, can I find a USA buyback service that was willing to accept books from Canada? And a, a number of them have turned me down, and a couple of them have have accepted. And then my third challenge is, can I find a book that they want? So. Uh, one of the things, one of the features of Scoutly is the wholesale integration, and that's one of the, the settings in the back. So you see on on the screen here, we've got BR, SBYB, and 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 Z. Um, so when I I scan this book, you know, the my setting said reject it, but hey, I can buy that and sell it to. If I have you know, a customer of one of these three services, I can sell it for 445 US, which is a bit more than 530 Canadian. So as long as I'm not spending five bucks buying it, I can buy the, I can buy books and turn a profit on selling sending them to the US. So if you haven't got your wholesale integration turned on to get your book buyback then you're you're leaving money on the shelf. I guess that's my message for you. Um, the other things I want to talk about USA buybacks is Trustpilot. Uh, there's a number of, you can type in the name of the book buyback service and get information on how other booksellers have, have rated it. So in this case, sell back your book came back, but 4.5 out of five was an example. Um, there's another app called Book Scouter, which I keep on my phone. And I, I scan a book and it tells me uh, what the offers are. Because sometimes I, I double check to make sure that what uh, Scoutly is telling me is um, what's available on Book Scouter Live. And sometimes it just helps me making sure when I'm, I'm deciding on buying a book, just to make sure that the offer is there. And finally, don't go anywhere without this. So um, visiting relatives in other cities, that's an opportunity to go hit a thrift store somewhere else. Going away for the weekend, and this, uh, like we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I went up uh, in, into central Ontario, going through a lot of small towns, and I was hitting the, uh, the ongoing library sales in some of the small towns that I could find on Book Sale Finder. And a lot of it is, you know, run in, scan a whole bunch of books, move along. There's a lot of untapped honey pots out there. Just look for opportunities. So questions, comments, oh, be the person who looks for the looks for the IBS to scan. If you don't see it on the back of the book, open the book up. So I'm going to stop at that. Cool. Uh, Susanna says, can you teach me how to ship to USA from Canada? I'm in Ontario, two and a half miles from the border. Yep. Yep. Um, go to if you go to uh, stallionexpress.com. I'm just going to type it in the. Uh... Yeah, Matthew it's, says it's, he wants a scanner to, to carry in the card. The worst is when you're out scanning. Yeah. It dies. It's the worst. Yeah, the Stallion Express website's got a map of all their locations. So you have to, you can find, uh, you know, where you live compared to one of their locations. There's other cross-border shippers, but Stallion is the one which is conveniently close to me. If you guys have questions, go ahead and you can use a raise your hand feature under the emojis, I think, or reactions. Use the reaction, raise your hand, and we'll get your questions answered. So what's your, what's your favorite buyback service in the USA? Uh, <laughs> my my favorite is is Top Dollar for books because he he buys home run books. These are the ones that they're going to sell for well well in excess of a hundred bucks. So mm -hmm. he pays more and he he will contribute to shipping. I find uh, most services either um, they've either turned me down or they won't pay for shipping. 
Yeah. So, and you know, I, I hey, I get it. You know, there's there's a border in the way, and we're for I'm further north. So, but. other questions, guys. Use the raise your hand feature. Turn your cameras on. Raise your actual hand. Book buyback sites will pay you now. You don't have to wait for the sale. Yeah, yeah what's Matthew's that, got a good point. When when do you uh, when are you sending to a buyback versus Amazon? Like if you're making ten dollars on Amazon, are you gonna send it to a buyback for three dollars or? Um, if there's a two dollar difference, I will send it to a buyback service. So I, if I can make ten on Amazon, I'll sell it for eight right now and be done with it. Yeah. Um, shipping is it's slightly more expensive to cross border than it is for me to. It's like a for me, it's like a buck to ship it to Amazon versus like a dollar thirty for me to ship it cross border. So, you know, that's six of one, but then I'm getting thirty percent um, exchange on the other part. Um, some of the buyback services they're they're paying me like within two weeks of buying the book. Like I buy it, stick it in the box. It's gone yes. within two or three days. And, and I got cash in the bank in, yeah. in two weeks. Yeah, that's and awesome. It, to me, it's awesome because if I was, as a Canadian, if I wasn't looking for US buyback, that book would just sit there and I'm just leaving money on the shelf. So, yeah. so yeah. same for anybody else. Judith, you wanna unmute yourself? You got to click it again. Boom. Okay. Hey, glad to be here. David, you said something about leaving money on the table, which you said a few times, but this was something about, and I was right here sitting in my car watching something about warehouse. If you're not doing, I think the word was warehouse. It was just about four minutes ago. Could you repeat that or say more about that? Um, you had a Scoutly, you had Scoutly on your screen and you yep. would open something on scoutly and i oh it's okay it's called wholesale integration i think it's called so wholesale integration okay so if if you have scoutly just i do you. if people yes, do maybe, i'm gonna yeah. do my scoutly so okay. then i go to my menu menu you just mm -hmm. follow follow me i'm writing it down um settings okay and then pretty sure it's on the settings page and then there's i'm just gonna go there's one on the there's this screen here i don't know if you can see i it. can't i can't see anything it just looks like a white out like a white chalkboard okay but, so um, what, I'll do, what i'll do is i'll uh on the settings screen Mm -hmm. there's a setting called wholesale integration mm -hmm. and, and i'll put this all in the that? chat in a bit. what okay. what it does is it it activates the feature in scoutly to present the buyback prices oh wow okay activate so, the feature in scoutly to so buy that presented price. on your screen yeah thank so you so if, if you, you don't activate it you never you never know absolutely yes that's right we never know yeah. okay so because i've activated it what it does is it, it presents the numbers on the screen whenever they're available and if the offer the highest offer is more than my um, my cost price it pings me it gives me an audio cue. And did you, oh, you didn't even have to set that up. That's just integrated no. into Scout. Yeah, just because, because I've turned it on. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. That's awesome yeah. to know. Thank you very, yeah. very much. So afterwards, um, I'll put, I'll put these instructions in the chat so, just in case I've, someone else has missed it. Go ahead. Awesome. But, so you could essentially check all your duds. So I have a pile of duds yep. that maybe I'll, right. Yep. So you could just whip right through it and you and they scan, yep. which is by back your books, the scanner doesn't work very well. Where am I? Yep. It doesn't work hardly ever. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Yep. Thank you very hey. much. And Avery, thank you. Welcome.
Yeah. Bookscouter.com does the same thing. You can get that. That's awesome. You can get that app. Always more phone. to learn. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Thank you so much. I have it on my phone. Yes. All right. Bye bye. <laughs> approach the topic of letting you scan the books first. Yeah, I scan my duds. Did you hear me? Um, I don't know. Very clear. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach the library sale? Like, how do you approach them and say, hey, can I scan through your books first? Um, what I, how I did it in the first year is they were like, I was, I signed up for the the friends of the library website just to be a to be a friend of the library. Yeah. Then so then at a point in time you, you start getting all the emails and one of the emails says, you know, hey, we're having a book sale. We're looking for people to volunteer. So, okay, sure, I'll, you know, I know something about books, I'll help. Then um the first, you know, they, at the end of the first night they say, "Okay, well, you know, we've if there's any books you want, you know, then help yourself. The price is, you know, so many dollars per book. So then, like, I ran off to the uh, the textbook and the the spirituality book section because I figure those were my two best opportunities for quick profits. Then, you know, people see me sitting there, like, like scanning away. So, so then I say, oh yeah, this, you know, this is what I do, and you know, I I resell books on Amazon. And it's kind of like, oh, that's cool, you know, because the libraries, this is Matthew mentioned this, the libraries want money. They want money now. So they were happy. Yeah. And I will say, if you go to a library and help them move all the books and set them up and you spend an hour doing that, yep. very hard pressed for them not to let you look through the books afterwards. Yep. I literally yep. set up almost whole library sales by myself. And then afterwards, yeah. you're like, dude, you, you can scan everything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. For me, they, they put a time limit on it because they want to go home at a point, right? <laughs> so they say, 20 minutes. You got 20 minutes. So it's important to know what category can I hit first. Yeah. Uh, David, do you have an alternate Scoutly setting besides the default setting? I'm not sure if you talked about that. Um, so I've got a, like a primary setting of... I do by popularity of books. So books that sell um, like 140 to 180 days, that's one group. Second group, like 100 to 140. Um, I, I sort of dwindles down to anything more than it sells five times. But by the time it's selling um, five times in six months, it better be selling it for a hundred bucks or more. I don't know if that if that makes sense. Like for if it sells every day, I'll take five bucks a book. If it sells, you know, once or twice a month, but maybe I'll I'll take ten or fifteen. But by the time it's selling once every six months, then it you know better be gold. Yeah. Do you want me to put this in the chat just because I can I can do it quickly in the chat just during okay. the next presentation. Other questions for David. Uh, he said price limits for these groups. Yeah, I, I can, I can I'll scribble down something in the, in the chat when, when, when we're, uh, when this section is done. Do you give one-on-one -on -one mentorship to fellow Canadians? <laughs> says Susanna. Um, I, don't, I will, I would be helpful to a point. I'm not going to be your forever coach. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Hey, if the price is right, <laughs> the price is the price is right. Do some textbooks. Other questions? Anyone got questions live? All right, we'll right. give David some love. Drop drop some threes in the in the comments for David. Uh, we got one more question. Uh, we'd like to. Or would like to get to the point, and no, that's not a question. <laughs> would like to get to the point where I don't need a couch for long. Uh, Rustum says three, Susanna, Basil, Matthew. We got threes rolling in. Judith, Frank, Joji, Denise. Love it. I'm number three. I'm number three. I'm number three. Thank you, everyone.
I'm going to yeah, mute God. myself up. I really appreciate you. Um, okay. Our next speaker has amassed a following of over 350,000, primarily talking about the stuff we're talking about tonight. And uh, he grew that on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. But before we bring him on, uh, let's go ahead and get everybody entered into this drawing real quick. So uh, exciting news. We have return reports now on, on uh, gotolister.com as of literally five minutes ago. My developer didn't even text me yet, but it's live. So you can check your returns here. You can also obviously check your orders. I won't open that up because you go steal all my products. Uh, you have profit analytics, you have sales analytics. And just a reminder, all you got to do is go to gotolister.com to enter. This is factually the fastest listing software on the planet. You will never have to worry about repricing again because we give you, I give you my complete repricing strategy. Today and today only, you're getting access to my course, which I usually charge $400 for. Literally all this is free and you get a chance to be enrolled for a $700 giveaway. And you guys are gonna have pretty good chances of winning. We'll probably have 30 to 50 people apply. So go ahead and sign up at gotolister.com and then drop your email below. My team is going to put all these in a spreadsheet and then we're going to use a random number generator to pick a winner. And we'll be doing this in the next 30 minutes. So drop your emails below. I'll give some shout outs to any new users we have. And a lot of you guys have already commented your email. So Dawn's, Dawn's getting her entry in. We got... Montavious, Cordell, iPhone, Francesca. I love the iPhones coming in. Roz, no, you don't have to enter again. If you enter it again, you're going to confuse my team, but I like reading names anyway. So if, you, if you're trigger happy, go ahead and enter that. Um, Manny says she's been trying to pay for her plans since mother. Our, our team has been slammed. I apologize. We, we just hired a new customer service agent. Big shout out to Rona. She's in here today. Give Rona some love. Drop some R's in the chat for Rona. She's been helping out go to and managing this Zoom call, letting you guys in. So also a reminder, if you guys have restricted books, shoot them over to restrictedinventory.com. We'll sell your textbooks for you. 50-50 split net profit. We've been in business for almost four years now. Pretty crazy. Through some ups and downs, about five account shutdowns, but we're we're trucking along. Uh, we have an official partner who can who's never going to get gated in textbooks. And if you just look, this is an actual consigner of ours. He wanted me to change his name. He's a pretty big bookseller. He sends us a ton of books. And if you would have just sold these for cash to zip it textbooks.com or Valor, Valor Books pays the most for textbooks. He would have gotten fifty four hundred if you would have sent them to Valor textbooks during textbook season which is when these buyback services pay the most. But instead he sent it to restrictedinventory.com and we made $18,000 profit and he got his half of 9,000. So that's the power of selling books on Amazon FBA. Uh, the prices are incredibly high. So, all right, William, you ready to rock and roll? The money badger. You wanna actually, I have to ask you to unmute yourself, I think. What's hey, going on, brother? Good. Thanks for having me. It's been well. Good. Um, so you just want to hop into some Q and A, or do you have a little something, little some nuggets planned, or you just want to jump straight into? Uh, we can hop into Q and A, but I can give you a real quick background. Okay. Um, so my wife and I have been selling on Amazon for, uh, I want to say four or five years now. Um, primarily books. We do do um, movies and music. Uh, but books is probably about 95% of our business. Um, we've gone through most of the ups and downs. We've uh, done pretty much every model except for private label you can. Um, but we keep coming back to books. Uh, and I, I'm a big proponent for selling books on Amazon. Um, many of you guys that have already sold on Amazon can agree that it's, it's probably the easiest bridge to learn the platform completely and then you can kind of like take what you like and grow from there. So for that, we really enjoy that uh, flexibility. It's it's probably the most rewarding um, and merit-based thing that we've done so far. So 
that's our shtick. But uh, feel free to ask me any questions you guys have about uh, selling books on Amazon or media in general. I was muted. Uh, I will also say, you know, you've amassed a following of 300,000. Uh, I don't even know how many on TikTok now, but uh, that's also impressive as well. Thanks. We're up to 450,000. Oh, wow. Another 130. That's yeah, great. It's all book content. So it, I, the majority of my content is instructional. So if you yeah. guys want to check out uh, the Money Badger on any of the social platforms there are. We got, um, we got socials below. It's, uh, it's pretty much the same content on all platforms. So yeah, we got We got them on. If you've been posted on YouTube, you got to get them on that YouTube grind. Yeah, I haven't messed with YouTube yet. Have you met Joji? I have not. Joji's here. Joji flips textbooks. Uh, he, he's Yo, also. What's up? What's up, Joji? Oh, man. Good to see you, man. Good you to meet too. you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So he he's he's like a miniature Caleb Roth. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> How's the textbook game you treating you? Uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, definitely been going uh, going well now that I started the YouTube channel last year. I've been you know focusing more on uh, sourcing, and so definitely when you source more, sales go up. So it's been pretty good for me at least. So I'm a high school teacher as well. So I just sell books on the side and use that to pay for all living expenses and then invest all of my income and wife's income in the stock market. And our goal is to retire with 35. That's what we're doing. Good goals. Good goals. Yeah. Yeah. You guys should definitely link up at some point. For sure. Trying to get the money badger at one of these Miami events. <laughs> yeah. Well, timing's been messed up uh, last couple of years. So yeah. this coming year, probably. Cool. Cool. Uh, do you ever send in when not green? Uh, do you ever send books in that do not turn green? What's your criteria to do so, if so? Yeah, so you, you, if you do it long enough, you, you start to understand the numbers of the category that you're operating in. Uh, so that the tool is really just a guideline at that point. And sometimes the tool is less accurate than what your experience is. So generally speaking, we... We try to avoid anything that's ranked over 750,000 these days with Amazon's new changes to their storage fees, with the algorithm changes, uh, uh, restocking limit changes were a killer for quarter four for a lot of sellers. Uh, so what we did was we pivoted and we've changed our business model a little bit. So we're more condition-based and sales rank, sales velocity focused. Uh, so when, when you find a book that scans and doesn't turn green or doesn't ding or doesn't tell you, hey, this is a definite win, Relying on the numbers and the sales velocity, in other words, you know, if it's ranked well, if it's ranked anywhere, you know, 750,000 or less in books, you know, that's top half a percent, top three quarters of a percent. So it didn't get there by accident, right? So then from there, if you can understand like the sales velocity and how many times it's sold in a month, you can make an educated guess on whether or not it's a, a worthy book to be sending in. So uh, there's many times where you could do it, but uh, just understand what you're looking for. Awesome. Just passed a thousand in profit today, according to go to lister. Hell yeah. Got to make sure my, my, uh, buy costs are all entered. There's a couple that need to be entered. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are your ranking thresholds for other items? Like, do you do, do you do, uh, CDs, DVDs and video games? Yeah. Um, video games is a really small category. Uh, as far as, you know, compared to books, I'll usually send in any kind of video game that's like 100K or less. Usually it's like 50K or less is a sweet spot. The lower yeah. you can go, the better, but 50K is really like on average what you'll expect to find. Movies, same thing, maybe 70K or less, but whenever you can find a movie that's like 20 to 30K or less, that's going to sell pretty quickly. And you could probably expect to see three, $4 profit, depending on where you're buying them and how much they're costing. Yeah. Yeah, those Blu-rays, man. I've always had good luck with those. Yeah, the thing I, I find, I call it Boomer TV. So like any kind of movie or TV show that you used to watch, like growing up with your dad or, you know, or, you know, if if that's what you used to watch, maybe in the 90s, like movies for guys who like movies. Anybody remember that? Like those those are the books and or those are the movies that tend to sell. So a lot of John Wayne, a lot of the Tom Selleck stuff, a lot of the old Western stuff sells. Uh, and you'll see those things spike to $20, $30, $40 profit pretty easily. 
Yeah. So, so Bill, are you, uh, I, I somehow haven't come across you on, I don't know if you have a YouTube channel or not, but it looks like you're on kind of the he other TikTok. That's his space. TikTok. Okay. <laughs> yeah, TikTok's I, I kind of like my groove just cause I like I, I'm gritty. I, I don't like to do the whole polished editing and all that. I don't have a lot of time. We got yeah, five yeah. kids, so I haven't gotten into YouTube yet. Gotcha. Uh, I'm wondering, so what, what is sort of, uh, what exact, like, what is your model? Are you a thrifter then? Or are you like bulk buying? Or are you like, what's kind of it? Yes, to all of it. Uh, to all so, of yeah. Okay. So, so the, the, the real key to our success is strategic relationships. Uh, cool. Whenever you're in a supermarket or a thrift store or an estate sale, or you're, you're talking with anybody, if you bring it up what you're doing, or you're, you're casually finding a way to, to bring it in a conversation, it's just going to organically find ways to put you in front of people that could potentially help you out. So uh, we just recently partnered with a, a clean out company that, um, you know, they do clean outs for estate sales. Uh, and we just got on with a, a property manager that runs like 6,000 properties. Um, so depending on what business model you want to approach and how involved you are in your community and how well known you are, um, you don't necessarily have to go to a thrift store. The thrift stores are generally like the low hanging fruit. Avery, you can attest to this. Uh, once you find some success in a thrift store, you're going to really want to swim upstream as soon as possible. You know, you're going to want to find a way to get those books before those competitors that you're scanning against, you know, can get there. So whether that means going to backroom access or building those strategic relationships to get them before they even get to the thrift store, that that's really what you want to try to do. So um, we'll take books however we can. We'll do free book pickups. We'll do estate sales. We'll do libraries, library sales, thrift stores, you name it. That's cool. I think what's awesome is the theme of this is being a little bit more creative in the way that we source, because obviously, I mean, there's a reason why so many Goodwill accounts on Amazon have hundreds of thousands of reviews because they're selling all the books that they get for free for some pretty good money. And it's like, I didn't really used to thrift very much in the beginning, but I actually buy tons and tons of books from Goodwill because I do all all my book arbitrage. So I buy a whole bunch of books from Goodwill on Amazon and on eBay to flip them back on Amazon when they're undervalued. But it's, I think definitely one thing that you know, for everyone else that's here is, and even for me, is like, you, you got to be creative in how you, how you source books. And everyone who's been on this call, who's been talking is like, Hey, I don't just go to a thrift store like everyone else. Like I've got relationships that are unique and special to where I'm at. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, no, a thousand percent. It's who, you know, not necessarily what, you know? Yeah. The questions for the money badger. Yeah, you guys can raise your hand to virtually raise that hand. We'll get you out here. What's up, David? Hey, David, how you doing? Hey, hey. Um, older game systems like PS2. So it's, it's yeah. been like a thousand years since uh, I owned one. Is there still a market for those games, or can you get any comments? Absolutely, on yeah. So what you're going to find is the greatest hits ones are generally a little less valuable. Yeah, you know, but like after they get to a certain point, they're a lower price point. It's the same game, but um, there's absolutely a market for any of those systems. Uh, okay. You just got to kind of, after a certain point, it, it gets to be like a nostalgia thing, you know, like yes. <laughs> uh, a lot of the guys that like grew up or girls that grew up, you know, playing those games. Like we all mm -hmm. had our certain games. Like for me, for Nintendo, it was like Double Dragon, Battletoads, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And for other people, it might be the racing games. So, but there's definitely a market for all of it. Nostalgia will always sell. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, just another touch on uh, on books and movies too, guys. Don't don't forget about sets. I think sets are something that a lot of people kind of sleep on, especially with the with the motif of this being uh, being creative. I think a lot of people will overlook scanning a book. And this goes back to the question that was asked earlier about accepting books that don't necessarily turn up green. Um, especially now the days that we're, we've changed to a more conditional format, we find ourselves taking a look more closely at fiction. Uh, and that leads us down the road at a lot of sets, especially young adults. So you could find plenty of books that don't necessarily populate a good, green, profitable, good e-score, good sales, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, but when you put two or three of them together and you form like a four volume set or a three volume set, um, you could still make a, a decent, you know, 10, 20 bucks in some cases. Yes, sir. Those McKay, the, at McKay's, those Twilights, uh, they, pre they price them for five cents. You can build, what's the Twilight set go for? The 
five five book set. Well, you've got you've got the Twilight set that's just the novels, and you've got that one weird little extra book afterwards. Yeah. But they're, that, they're that's both the yeah, they're both pretty good as long as the buy cost is solid. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough to pick them up for like two bucks at a goodwill, but if you get them for free, it's that's money. Yeah, I tell you that a little tidbit. The thing about McKay's books, man, like they're all in pristine condition for the most part. And you're going to find some scrappy books in there, but if you find books that are in new condition where maybe they've still got this thing in the back or they're still shrink wrapped or they're still creaking when they're opening, like it's the same risk as you would go into a clearance section at Walmart to pick up some cleats or some candy or whatever. It's, it's still arbitrage, right? So you're still running the risk if you're doing that versus selling used media as new because you don't have an invoice. And, and I think a lot of people overlook that step. We may or may not sell your textbooks for new if you send them to restrictedinventory.com. <laughs> it's <laughs> something that, you know, uh, I think I've seen up in the reports before. Uh, I know a lot of big sellers that abide by that. They'll, they'll list their books as new. Play at your own risk, you know, and if Amazon asks you for invoices, you can't give them. You know, obviously you're screwed, but different categories are different, different publishers different so just know know what you're doing um chris says what do you think about reverse engineering or sourcing by looking directly for books by publishers who publish expensive and rare books in other words starting your search based on the publisher yeah it's a creative outlet that's a creative way of looking at it you know if you've got a couple of different publish publishers that you know tend to produce higher dollar books you, you're probably looking at textbooks you know or any kind of nonfiction that's like in the educational space a lot of the supporting materials for theology or physics or science or math or those sorts of things they tend to command a higher value anyway um but just like avery was just saying you know you want to be very careful about which publishers you're you're playing with because some of them are litigious and some of them you know just don't care yeah. Yeah. JD says sets I put together Holman Bible commentary set. Uh, he sold for 900 cost him 55 bucks. Mostly FBA or FBM for, or eBay for sets. That depends, you know, cause everything's got a different market. I find that eBay has got less eyeballs. So it generally commands a lower price for the same book. Um, but you know, I, I find most of my stuff I can sell on Amazon. You know, whatever I can't sell, I'll check eBay. There are the occasional times where we'll throw it on Mercari but or, or local, but for those instances, they're very, very rare. We try not to hold a lot of like merchant fulfilled or sell stuff we ship out, you know. Do you, do you ever mess around with online arbitrage books? Like, do you ever see a book like priced really low and just pick it up? Yeah, I've done that a couple of times. Back when uh, eFlip just came on the market, I, I tried playing with that, but... Um, you know, when I was doing that, we were in Tennessee. So, I mean, you know how the bins were in, in Nashville, plus you had McKay's, plus you had all those goodwills right there, you know, like in the in the higher net worth areas. So it's like you, you get such a volume of books out of Tennessee that if you're struggling to sell books in Tennessee, you're doing something wrong. Dude, go up north to the northeast, like yeah. Massachusetts, um, every, Rhode Island, like that whole area, that whole region. Connecticut, it's it's just insane. Mama yeah, profits. Like, think about how many colleges are in like a 20 mile radius, you know? Yeah. Mama profits goes into the store with her Amazon seller app and scans like as slow as a slug. And she's pumping out three to five K months, you know? So but we're lucky in Tennessee to have McKay's across the South. They don't really have something like that up there. Yeah, no, for sure. Then I, th I think Tennessee happens to be like a central hub for um, what is it? Um, half price books and goodwill, you know, cause they've got, you've got like in, uh, in Nashville, you've got two of those goodwill outlets that are yeah. maybe 10 miles apart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Those outlets are something else. How do you start buying books in bulk? Have you ever messed with that? I remember back in the day, you and I, we went to some restaurant near my place in Tennessee yeah. <laughs> we were talking about doing bulk books together. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago, man. Um, easiest way I would say to get into bulk is work with a source, you know. Um, maybe purchase from the Goodwill outlet near you, right? Start there. And what you'll find is that if you go to the Goodwill outlet and you're searching through the bins, um, 
there's going to be certain days where the bins clearly look like trash. It's like how many times have they run the same bin through the system? You know, those are probably salvage, right? So they run through, they run through, they run through, they go back into a Gaylord, then they sell them out as salvage. You want unsorted. You don't want to get the salvage. Salvage has already been picked through. So you want to try to swim upstream a little bit. And the only way to tell whether you're getting good or bad quality is to go source there first. Source there a few times. Figure out if the quality's good, if the competition's good, and then get in good with the management and see if you can find a way to like score a good deal. And some of these goodwill outlets, they're really, really willing to work with you. And some of them, not so much. So it's going to be a case by case basis, but don't get discouraged. What kind of volume would you recommend somebody purchase bulk books? Like if they just want to try it out? Well, I mean, you're, you're going to be looking at, you know, seven to 10% acceptance rate, you know, so with a thousand books, approximately in a Gaylord, you could do the math pretty easily on how many books you're going to get, you know, as a, as an accept or a profitable book. So the, the first exercise that I would encourage anybody looking to get into bulk books would do would be to calculate, you know, what that break even looks like, you know, how many books do you need to get, you know, and what's the cost? Because, you know, if it's a thousand books and you're only going to get a hundred good ones, what are you going to do with all the duds, right? So if you've got a great way to monetize your duds, maybe you've got a bookstore or you've got a, you know, little local library that you can work with, or you've got a flea market or you've got, you know, a recycling company or a place like McKay's in Nashville, where you can trade them in, you get store credit and then you can use the store credit to source at the bookstore. Um, I think that's going to be a, a big chunk of your profit when you're going into bulk books. So you don't necessarily want to just look at the, the accepts from the batch. You want to figure out how to monetize every piece of it as you possibly can. You know, and it, it, I've come across so many people in the book community. There are people that are actually buying books just for the color of the books and they'll put them in batches of five, 10, 15, and they'll sell them for decor. So, I mean, there's ways to sell things, you know, you could take fiction books, for example, used fiction books that aren't in great condition at all. You wrap them up in some brown paper, you tie some little like butcher's thread around them and you do date night with a book, right? And you write a little like little snippet description on the front of the book. Maybe you sell it that way in a, in an Etsy store or in a Macari store or locally or whatever, you know, so the creativity that you're bringing into the space is really what's going to make your like secret sauce. It's not just, I got to scan these books. I find these books and 12 of them are profitable, rinse and repeat. It's deeper than that. Yes, sir. We got Manuel saying, do you sell full-time or just part-time? I've been selling full-time uh, for the better part of four years. That's crazy. I feel like I remember when you quit your job. When did you quit your job? About nine you... months after I started. I was packing my freaking parachute as soon as I figured out it was profitable. Yeah. <laughs> I think we finally kicked the bucket um, right before the pandemic started. And then we went really heavy. Um, into like retail arbitrage after the pandemic hit because you couldn't get books, you know, you couldn't. Send do you still in. mess with retail arbitrage much? <clears throat> I, I do sometimes, but where I'm at, the clearance section is very competitive. So I don't have a lot of time to like go super deep. What really worked really well in Tennessee was we were at a place called uh, Bargain Hunt. Now Bargain Hunt is a big, like, um, it's almost like a dollar general or a, a dollar tree size store, but they buy, um, Target and Amazon returns, and then they'll put them on the shelf. And a lot of the stuff they have are just fine, right? They're mass market products, Oreos, Cheez-Its, that sort of thing. Some of it is grocery that's close to expiration. So you've got six months or less to make sure that it sells before there's a problem. Some of it's toys, some of it's private label stuff. So you get really well-versed in learning how to read KIPA charts and how to determine whether or not you're going to get an IP complaint on a listing. Uh, but there's nothing like that here in Philadelphia or like near Philadelphia. We haven't found it. I mean, there's a place that like the tons of these little bin places that do like the seven, six, five, four, three dollar every other day thing. But it's nothing like that where you can walk in and there's five of them in a 50 mile radius. And like every store has got the same inventory for the most part. So if you know you got these Oreos, you know, at this one and you buy 20 of them, but you go to the other five stores or the other four stores, you do the same thing. Now you've got a sizable piece of inventory that you're probably making 10, 15 bucks on. So if you can find a, a place where you can get some discounted or like, you know, liquidated grocery items, th there could be some money there. Just you want to be careful with those expirations. Yeah. What advice would you have for someone who's interested in starting a personal brand and what have you gotten out of your personal brand? Maybe that you didn't expect. Uh, so take the good with the bad. Uh, 
not everybody's going to agree with you. Not everybody is going to, you know, want to hear what you have to say. And not everybody's going to think that what you're doing, especially if you're building a personal brand in the reselling space, uh, is on the up and up. You know, I, I get comments all the time about how I'm a parasite or I'm a, you know, a leech or a drag on society. And, you know, as a reseller, you kind of embrace that. So uh, as far as getting out of your personal brand, you get a little bit more self-awareness, you know, so that that's a really good thing to have, especially in today's world where you can kind of take that into your business life. And it gives you better perspective when you're building those strategic relationships to help grow your business. Um, for anybody that's looking to start a personal brand, I would say, first and foremost, be genuine, just be you. Don't worry about trying to be who you think people want you to be. You don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to be a certain age. As long as you're you, people can like see that. And people have a tendency to gravitate towards real people. You know, real recognizes real. So be you, don't be somebody else. You know, there's only one of you. There's tons of other people, you know, so just figure out how to be you. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Are you going to go to the Gary V conference coming up? The you- no, I, I went last year. Timing's off this year. You know, my uh, my oldest has prom out of state, so we got to go up to New York. So, yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to join that because um, I can't go this this time. He has them like four four times a year, right? No, it's once a year. Now, uh, VCon's once a year. So wait, this one in Indianapolis is uh, that's the VCon? Yeah, yeah, because. He did it in Minneapolis last year. Uh, this year, I think, is Indianapolis. Uh, he hasn't announced next year. Gotcha. Yeah, I'd definitely be there next year. But There's a lot, year, of people. Be... a lot of people go. Yeah, you were, you were like face-to-face with him. That was cool. Yeah, I loved it, man. Super down-to-earth. Yeah. You know, it gives you like real, real advice and like genuine time. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's rare these days to get somebody's like full attention, and when when you're talking with them, um, it, it's like undivided attention. You know, it's like that person's yeah. actually trying to be present in the communication, and it's it's refreshing. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I love Gary Vee. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of, about selling digital items online. What are your thoughts? Digital items, yeah. So. Um, Tons of great people you can follow as far as like print on demand or like writing your own book or creating a coloring book or t-shirts or whatever. Yeah. There's tons of money to be made there. It's a, it's a different hustle though. Yeah. You know, know. Steve, Steve, you could ask him about his story with Kindle. He's still making money off Kindle. (laughs) He, uh, he made some Kindle books and basically found out how to hack the system to make it look like people read the books by like nice. putting a hyper at the beginning. So they go to the end of the book and then Amazon would boost it. And he was making bank for a while, like five figs profit a month. He still makes like a few hundred dollars each month. That's still awesome, man. Yeah. Guys, just a reminder, comment your email below. Rona and Rustum, you, you tallying these up for everyone? How we, how we looking on the giveaway? Yeah, I am. Well, we already have 45 participants. 45. So that means you guys all have, what is that, at least a 3% chance of winning. So you, each person in here has a 6% chance of winning something, if, if my math is not incorrect. So we have $500 worth of profitable books that we're shipping to one of your houses. And we also got this Rolo printer. The proportions of these pictures are not... It's not proportional, but the Rolo printer, 200 bucks. It's our preferred printer at GoTo Lister. It uh, allows you to print. You never pay for ink, thermal printing, and you can print uh, UPS labels. You get UPS labels for free from UPS and book labels as well. They're interchangeable. Um, so anybody who has a GoTo Lister account, 100% free to sign up. You go to GoToLister.com, give it a try. If you absolutely hate it, you're not going to be charged with anything. You can cancel at any time. Just let me know why you canceled so I can make it better. That's it. We'll tally up these last few emails. And if anyone has confusion at all on how to sign up, simply go over to go to lister.com. Oh, yeah. Everyone's getting a course for free today, too, who signs up. But all you do is go to go to lister.com. Click on the free trial link, put your email in, put your credit card information in. You're not going to get charged. It's a 14 day free trial. And yeah, that's it. We'll get those tallied up and we'll announce the winner of this giveaway. But until then, let's uh, 
get some more questions for William. It's weird calling you William. I'm just, he's calling you the money badger. I hope when I have an Amazon account, someone applied for an Amazon account. Someone says I'm trying, I'm frozen right now. We'll get unfrozen. And I, I can't send up from Canada now, but if you guys keep asking, we got a lot of Canadians asking. We actually might make that a priority. So many people are asking for it from Canada. Johnny, we got we got Johnny saying, uh, ask you to unmute yourself, Bill. Uh, Johnny's saying he missed the money badger. You got any <laughs> questions, Johnny? You want to come on live? Johnny's a hustler. He's been traveling over the country, scanning books. He's following in your footsteps. Yeah. But does he have a canoe on his car? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> he has. He's been hiding it. You still got that busted canoe? I got two canoes, yeah. I, we actually have three back home. Uh, I'm going canoe with my family in a couple of weeks, or actually a month, month nice. and a half. Be going up almost in David's territory in Canada. Hopefully I'll see some moose in northern <laughs> Minnesota. Other questions before we're, we'll tally up all these and we'll announce the winner. Looks like Judith. Judith, what's up? Hey, Judith, how you doing? Hey, I do, are you saying that you actually sell books without a VA? Because I don't know that this question is in the realm of people who are using VA virtual assistants. I don't use a VA. I used to, but I don't anymore. Uh, what was your question about VAs? It's not about VAs. It's about this little wonderful thing I discovered. And it feels like a discovery when you find a way to Amazon to save a lot of money, which is called liquidating books. So I'm learning how to sell books. I've sold on MFA for a while, but I'm learning FBA. Okay. A little late to the game, but learning um, from these wonderful videos and groups and stuff. So liquidate. I press liquidate in this past week. So usually it costs a few pennies to liquidate a book. And sometimes there's actually a profit. Okay. But Amazon did not liquidate any of like 10 books. They disposed of them, which is about $2 a book. And I don't, I checked it, triple checked it, liquidate. I'm just wondering if anybody, you have any experience with that? It was yes. probably an automated removal. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably an automated removal because if you go into your settings, usually it, there's a setting that's automatically set and you could turn it off. Um, so like if the timing was off, like in other words, like I've created removal orders for liquidation or just disposal or whatever. Uh, and sometimes it's it's a couple of days in some cases or a week, right. you know, for that matter, before Amazon actually gets rid of it. And it's kind of frustrating, but like if if you've generated that removal order, but the system has already generated one prior, then it's going to read the I system got it. prior it's to yours. Read the system. Yeah. And so Amazon, can can you just, I mean, I hope this will help someone else too. So I did something that I didn't know, or it's just a, it's just a fallback setting that Amazon has. And so then they dispose of the book after 180 days or 300 and something days. Or how does that work? Uh, so a lot of times the automatic removals um, that I have said anyway, uh, they, they primarily only affect my stranded inventory. But um, what, you're, what you want to do is you want to definitely refresh yourself on the updated storage and removal fees because Amazon changed them in the beginning of the year. And mm -hmm. in some cases, they're extremely like punitive. You mm -hmm. know, so that was the Excellent. biggest reason for us changing our business model to go with the lower sales rank for like faster sales velocity. So that we we're turning over our inventory. So whereas, for example, I'll give you an idea. I used to run, you know, six, uh, six to 7,000 units active at any one time on my account. Wow. Um, but with the new changes and the algorithm changes, sales velocity seems to have gone down. Uh, Amazon is on a lot more listings for books. So there's a lot of the yes. featured offer prices going on where like, you know, everything is saying, Hey, you should be able to sell this for 15, 16, $17, but in some cases it's selling for five, $6. Mm -hmm. Um, so with, with those things like all coming into effect at the same time, you're going to want to definitely understand the tiers and how much it costs to store a book versus remove a book and then build that into your, your anticipated costs in the beginning. And you want to be very proactive about removing your inventory 
because every single month over, I think like 180 days, it's, it's, it's extremely, charges. yeah, it's yeah, extremely it's punitive. Charges. And then once you get over yeah. a year, it's like, it's, it's really not even worth having there unless it's like a high dollar, like super right. long tail feline surgery type book. Um, yeah, it's, it's not something I would, I would keep, but, um, as far as the automatic removals, I, I'm not super well versed on like everything they affect i don't use them because i'm forced to be very proactive as far as removing inventory these days you have no choice mm -hmm. that's why i'm i'm liquidating so many books because i didn't know what i was doing when i first got here and how to really read a keep a chart so yeah keep in mind though even with liquidations in some cases those books are going to cost you money to liquidate you know but and, so and it might be it's more been, punitive than just removing yeah. it or disposing it so far, it's been pennies compared, 24 cents, something like that, compared to disposal, which is so, to me, so expensive. So yeah. it, again, this is under settings that you set, that you set those things up under? Yeah, it's under your settings, yep. So so you go, thank you, thank you. Yeah, if you thank go into you your sellers, no problem. If you go into your seller central on the right-hand side, there's a little gear on the mm -hmm. top right side right. of the screen, and that should give you the yeah. ability to manipulate the settings you need. All right. I appreciate that very much. Thank yeah. you for listening. And thank yeah, you no a problem. lot. All right. So we're waiting on one more person to sign up for, for GoTo list. <laughs> They're in the comment freaking out. So whoever that is, we'll wait for you. And then you can comment your email. And uh, Rustum's ready to rock and roll. Johnny Flip says, I got something to add on that. I'll ask him to unmute himself. Did you raise your hand, Johnny? Raise your hand, boy. Where are you at? So many people to look through. Hey, what's going on, guys? Yeah, what's so up? I just, I, not much, man. Just got out of the gym, feeling good. I uh, pulled in the driveway. But yeah, uh, apparently Bill of Sell Back Your Book uh, just introduced a feature where you could actually do removal orders to directly to Sell Back Your Book, and they'll make you whole for uh, whatever book they're buying through their program. So that's something that's pretty cool. Um you know, recoup a little bit of those removal or disposal fees. Send them to send them. Wait, the is, bill. That, is that through Seller Central? Um, what well, in regards to what? What do you mean? Wait, so you're saying remove the books to Bill, or how does that work? Yeah, I guess you just uh, select the removal address. As uh, I would have to pull up the the post. It's in the book. But he's not like. It, is it like an official integration with Amazon or is it just like, hey, send us? Yeah, send us I, it's not like an official integration or anything. Yeah, it's just kind of, yeah, I know. It would be so awesome too. Volume. I feel like it could get messy on his app though, you know, because they're sending a bunch of books. They're like, dude, these are garbage. What are you sending us? But uh, yeah, I don't so know. It's do kinda... that at restricted inventory, we allow people to do that. And we just, my lister just had uh 8,000 or not 8,000 800-ish or uh, maybe 2,000 textbooks delivered to her house and that's a lot of books and she's got two kids three dogs steep driveway and it was hot and so is she had a the, hell of is that the post where you're like uh the, the UPS driver's like man these kids on TikTok really are making money or something yeah. like that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny also, somebody's asking about what conference did we mention earlier? That's Miami Sellers Conference. I do it once a year in Miami. Johnny was there last year. Hopefully, Bill will be there next year speaking. Uh, you guys can get your tickets, early bird sale, MiamiSellersConference.com. Uh, what uh, do you have a question, Johnny? Uh, now I kind of just wanted to add that in to the whole removal disposal thing. Um, yeah, I was kind of in you, and out are you of the on TikTok at all. Yeah, I am. Dude, I, I've been doing so many back-end things right now in terms of like, you know, just kind of back-end business stuff, like opening business bank accounts. I'm trying to learn how to edit videos better, accounting, tracking, and trying to move into this ar to arbitrage here. And it's book, you know, it's book sales season. I'm getting distracted by all that and yeah. having a really hard time just, yeah. I definitely follow Money Badger on, on TikTok. Yeah. Just look at his content because, like he said, he doesn't really edit his stuff. He just kind of opens up his phone, goes, uses a TikTok editor, and gets like millions of views. <laughs> so, yeah, 
Yeah, I was checking them out yeah. a little bit yesterday. I was like, dang, this guy's awesome, man. <laughs> and I appreciate you. Heck yeah. Other last minute questions from anyone? We got one more email. Rustin, if you add that in there, Rustin, we're good to go. You got the last email, last two emails in there? Yeah, we're good to go. I already get that email. What do we have? 52 total or 51? Yes, 52. All right, 52. Rustin is going to do the run random number generator and just let us know who won. Okay, I will initiate it now. All right, this is for, we're going to do the first one for the Rolo printer. And the second one we'll do for the $500 in books. Okay, the number is 22. I'll check first the list. All right. Big shout out for Rustum. Drop an R in the chat for Rustum. For always. Jacob is the name. G? Jacob. Jacob. Where's Jacob at? Jacob. A lot of people drop an R. Jacob, Jacob Sorensen. He's a... Uh... Five below you on my screen. Oh, Jacob Sorensen has a different email. Probably he is not that one. Wait, did you just tell us the wrong person, Russell? No. There's uh -oh. Jacob and there's Jacob. Jacob. Oh, it's yes. Like Jacob. Jacob. How do you spell it's it? It's Jacob. The, I, I will drop the email address on the chat so okay. they can check that email address. Whoever J Jacob was that. Well, oh, people an email next time. Probably he's not around anymore. Okay. Yeah, you gotta be here to win. So let's do it again. Okay, I will draw again. Hang on. Number five is wait. Jacob. I'll, I'll, I'll Jacob the broken I'll heart. <laughs> That is other Jason. Amy Holloway. A Amy Holloway? Yes, Amy Holloway. Amy, where are you at? Are you still here? I recognize that name. She's in her inbox a lot. She's not here. Go again. Next one. Okay. You got to be here, here live. Go. 28. Number 28 is... Francesca Fontanes. Okay, she's here. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. We'll give a little celebration. Francesca, you are the winner of the Rolo printer. Oh, my God. Hi, guys. Hey, do you have a printer? I do have a printer, but it's not okay, the best. You get two. So this will be amazing. Now you don't have to exchange labels. You can have one printer for the book labels and one for the shipping labels. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm doing now, and it's a headache. Yeah, yes, and you never have to switch anymore. Oh my God, thank you so much. First world problems, <laughs> resolved. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll reach out to you via email and we'll get your address and we'll uh, prime ship that to you. Should have it in a couple of days. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, 100%. Thank you. It's been very, very, very nice this, um, this uh, chat with you guys. Yep. You're trying to provide value, trying to get your businesses to grow. So you yeah, guys I'm just going. starting. I've been doing it for maybe like a month and a half, and I'm learning so much from this uh, conversation, these groups and everything. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Where are you located? I'm in Miami, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah. Are you Cuban? No, I'm Puerto Rican. Puerto Rican. Te gusta bailar salsa? Un poquito. Un poquito. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of Cubans, they dance Cuban style in Miami. Exactly, like, yeah. It's basically yeah. everybody think I'm Cuban here. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. I'm just to You got to go to Orlando. Orlando, they told me that it's pretty, pretty, uh, very nice there uh, for sourcing. I'm thinking to do a trip there. I, By the way, today I was in West Palm Beach and it was really nice there. Miami, <laughs> I, I really like it more than Miami. It's worth it's to the job there. Go to Fort Lauderdale area and north of there. There's a lot of good books up there. There's a lot of wealth. So go to those thrift stores, go to those estate sales. They got some good okay. stuff. Fort Lauderdale. Okay. 
I'll try there. I didn't, I didn't been there. I, I would stay, stay mostly uh, like South Florida in around yeah. the Ventura area where, where I actually live, but I will try, I will try. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's where the developer of GoToLister, uh, the guy who made it for, for me, my partner, he lives somewhere around there, like oh. 40 minutes away from, from Miami. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Okay, so I will, I'll, of course, you will hear more from me here because I just log in. I, by the way, I, I send you a, a message here on the chat regarding okay. how to um how to transfer like the old I used to use different um a seller list I will say it here. Okay. I to, yeah but now that we were talking about go to lister it sounds more uh beginner friendly. Yeah. So I, I just don't know how to transfer the old batches that I did to be able to be everything on go to yeah I, I just released a YouTube video on that. Okay. So Rustam, when you send her, when you ask her for her address, could you send her my YouTube video on how to upload the CSV file? But um, you can just go to the profit analytics here and you'll be able to upload, you'll be able to download all your sales data. You can actually upload directly from Acceler list. Okay. So if you go to, I can't open it up because it has all my products, but if you click on orders, there's the ability to upload all your data from inventory lab or from Acceler list, and then it syncs it with it it. the current sales data. Okay, so, cool. And all of that is on the video, right? Yes. Okay, yep. so I, I will I will be on it. Thank you awesome. so much. I'm very excited yeah. for the future. Thank you so much. Yep. All, right. all right. Okay, now have we got great. $500. Yep, have a good one. Now we got $500 worth of used books to give away. So Rustam, go ahead and do that. Let us know who won. Yeah, so the, the sell back your book integration, you can, you can, looks like you can remove your inventory to sell back your book and then they'll pay you once they receive it. Okay, so we, do we need another draw? Yeah. Right. Okay. Let us know who it is. So number 48, wait, I'll check first. 48. One of the uh, last people. To I know. see. Wait, I'll check. Philip Cameron Barch. Philip. Philip Cameron here. Barch. There's a Philip in here. I'm gonna ask him to mute yourself. Is, is this is this the Philip that won? This is me. All right. Uh, Philip Cameron. That's me. Sure. All right. Sweet. Well, um, my team will reach out to you via email. We'll get your address and we'll ship you five hundred dollars worth of profitable books. Oh, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. 100%. How are you doing your book journey right now? Pretty good. I'm about two and a half months in. Nice. Um, I've been doing both books and uh, like uh, DVDs and CDs, and I've been doing great with them. I've watched awesome. like, a ton of your videos and love GoToLister. It's, it's helped me out a ton. Sweet. Well, you'll have a lot of books to list with it pretty soon. So, oh yeah, <laughs> can't wait. Awesome. All right, guys, thank you so much. Again, let's drop a one in the comment for all the speakers tonight. David, Don, Matthew, Bill. Who else am I missing? Steve didn't make it. We'll get Steve on next week. Steve and I are gonna do an eBay to Amazon webinar. So anyone who's interested in flipping items from eBay, to Amazon will be doing that. And the week after that, if you guys are interested in doing online arbitrage, I'm actually doing an online arbitrage boot camp the week after. So I'll be bringing on some of my younger friends who are crushing it with OA. I did 300,000 in, in online arbitrage last year, about an 8% margin. So um, there's a lot of potential there. You can do it from anywhere in the world. And it's a good way to step up if you're doing books and you want to look to diversify or spend more money. Online arbitrage is pretty cool. I get the emails, where do y'all pri primarily conversate Discord? We do Discord, but we have a really active Facebook group chat. So make sure to join my Facebook group. Make sure to join uh, the Hive Mind community too. That's uh, the Money Badgers Facebook group. We'll drop a link in the chat for that real quick too. He, uh, that, that's a pretty active group as well. I'll drop that in there. 
Boom. So that Facebook group I just dropped, that's uh, the Money Badgers Facebook group. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming in, and we'll see you guys in a week. Much love. Rustin, we, we can unmute everyone and everyone can say goodbye dramatically. Peace out, guys. Take it easy. Everybody Take have a good week. Guys. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, guys. Right. Right. Good seeing you. Guys. All right. Good night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you guys. Go get that money. Thank you. Awesome <laughs> night. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate you guys. Adios, mi amigos. Adios. Voy a bailar. Dance class. Hey, can I ask you a question right quick? Yeah, go for it. Oh, what's the name of the, the Discord? I think I was in here for like a year ago. I just got the email. Um, I the just, Amazon selling gang. I'll drop it in the chat real quick. Not the Amazon launch pad. No, I don't think that's it. No, it's the Amazon selling gang is what I call it, is what we call it now. Okay. It's uh, I got a picture of me and Taylor on a couch with a bunch of boxes. I'll, uh, let me see if I can share this real quick. Yeah, bro, I always get to emails. I always read them, but I, I'm just trying to get trying to get in there. That, man. All right, I just dropped it in the chat. Okay, thank you so much, bro. I really appreciate you. 100%. All right, you have a good day. Yeah, you too, Montavious. All right. All right, guys. Peace out. Have a good one.